Toledo was the preseason favorite in the MAC, largely because of tailback David Roars. But while the Rockets have made plenty of big plays on offense, they've had trouble getting the ball into the end zone. Defense is the Rockets' strength, and senior linebacker Steve Huffman is their hardest hitter. Tonight, on their home field, the Rockets will try to flatten the title hopes of Eastern Michigan, live on ESPN. We're live from the Glass Bowl. It's Eastern Michigan and the Toledo Rockets in an MAC conference game. And guess what? They're expecting a capacity crowd better than 19,000 here at the Glass Bowl. Hi, everybody. I'm Denny Schreiner. And make no mistake about it, this is the biggest football game in the history of Eastern Michigan University. If the Hurons win, they'll share at least a half of that Mid-American Conference championship. And also, they'll take another step closer to the California Bowl. Meanwhile, on the other side of the coin, the Toledo Rockets are 3-3. Three three. They've not yet been mathematically eliminated from the conference championship. If they win tonight, then again next week, and get some help from their friends, they too could share the MAC football title. Working with me this evening is former Ohio State All-America linebacker Stan White, and in essence, Stan, Eastern Michigan in five years has gone from the worst team in the MAC to perhaps the best. Well, Dane, let's put this in perspective. Eastern Michigan was the Columbia of the early 1980s, losing 27 in a row, the longest in the nation. They also were asked in 1984 to leave this conference and not play football anymore in the MAC. But three short years later, they're vying for the championship, a California Bowl berth. These guys have slowly but surely started believing in Jim Harkema and his program. And tonight's the final hurdle, the final test, to see if they really believe not only they can win, but they can be champions. Stan, it would appear that the key to success thus far this year for Eastern Michigan has been the play of their fifth-year seniors, especially the skill guys. And that's the difference between these two teams, between Toledo and Eastern Michigan, and that's the skill positions. They don't have a Ron Adams at quarterback or a Bob Foster or a Gary Patton at tailback. Ron Adams, a great quarterback, not throwing the ball as well this year, only about 50% completion, but he's made up for it being able to scramble and run over 400 yards of offense on the ground, including two big touchdowns that he scrambled for last week. Of course, Gary Patton, unanimous All-MAC last Year. Needs 18 yards to become the leading rusher in uh, Eastern Michigan history. Uh, they'll get him the ball a lot. He likes to go around the outside and also that delayed draw play. And Bob Foster, also, you don't lose much when you go to him. He's even tougher inside than Patton is. Toledo won its last five games last year. In essence, they were the pick this year coming into the Mid-American Conference. But the injury bug has bitten that team. They've had four different quarterbacks. That's posed all sorts of problems. Yeah, that is the problem. You may not believe this out there, but the guy who's starting a quarterback tonight, Bill Bergen, started this season season as a student coach he had in essence retired but they had to bring him out of retirement and he's played pretty well for him he's one of the top ranked quarterbacks in the MAC and he has to have a great game tonight the other problem is when they get down inside the plus 20 yard line trying to score they just cannot put the ball in the end zone anytime you have a field goal kicker who has more field goals than he does extra points you know you're having problems with offensive production well the last 10 MAC teams that have invaded the glass bowl have gone home losers so in essence Eastern Michigan is bucking the odds here this evening, trying to clinch at least a share of their first ever MAC championship game. Stay tuned. The opening kickoff is coming up next. ESPN's presentation of college football is being brought to you by... The U.S. Armed Forces. It's a great place to start. By Yashica. They put a new focus on photography with the new 230AF autofocus by Michelob Light. When the sun goes down, light up the night with Michelob Light. We're not a company. And several in his sixth year at the helm of the University of Toledo Rockets. And uh, he is born and bred in Toledo, Ohio. Yeah, when Elton John wrote the Rocket Man, he had to be thinking of Dan Simmerell. He played here, grew up here, assistant coach here, and then head coach. Uh, this is a job he's wanted all his life. And, of course, across the other way, a guy who has done an outstanding job at Eastern Michigan University in his fifth year, Jim Harkema, 20-31-2. and two, But, my goodness, he's had a problem winning games on AstroTurf. Not only AstroTurf, but on the road. In the MAC, nobody last year had a winning record on the road. And Harkema figured out if he could win on the road, he could win this conference. He instituted a, a slogan called the Road Warriors. They had pins. They had T-shirts. 
and the team has responded. It gave them a challenge. Athletes like goals and challenges. These guys have been up to it. They're three and one this year on the road, and they are in first place in the MAC. Eastern Michigan wins the opening toss. They have elected to receive the football, and there you see number 23, Frank Egris, a six foot, 187 pound senior from Richmond Heights, and then of course back deep in single safety, Glenard Smith. He is a speedster for Eastern Michigan, just about ready. And believe me, this is a big one for both teams, especially the Hurons of Eastern Michigan. Gerard Smith at about the 13, finds a little seam inside, spins, rolls around, and finally gets shellacked at about the 34-yard line. Nice return. Let's take a look at that Eastern Michigan offense, headed up by the most experienced quarterback in the MAC, number 10, Ron Adams. In the backfield, a couple of good ones, especially Gary Patton. He may be the best in the MAC. The receiver's a fine trio, perhaps the most speed, number 82, Craig Ostrander. And the tackles, Evans Hicks, 325 pounds. He's the best best pass blocker on that squad and then the interior people led by number 55 Jim Colissimo so it's first down and 10 for Eastern Michigan from their own 35 excellent field position well that's a play you'll see all night long a pitch to Gary this time he slips for no game the Toledo defense uh, Danny, Danny is a normal 34 defense. The outside linebackers are defensive ends. Mike McCreary, the leading tackler on the front line, also the fastest guy up front. On the interior, Paul Sandor is a 4840 man and also the strongest man. The inside linebacker, Steve Huffman, leading tackler, all MAC. Dwayne Fletcher, the best athlete back there, and Keith Saunders can bench press 415 pounds. Second down and 14, so a loss of the four on the first play by Patton Bainzinger in motion. Adams going to look to throw. They clear out. Bainzinger pulls it in, but is it a complete pass? Yes, it is. Back to about the original line of scrimmage. Yeah, I'll tell you what, that looked like he trapped the ball from here, but nobody called it. Uh, Adams just didn't get him the ball. He was wide open in the flat. There was nobody out there. If he'd have got it, he'd have had some running room. So we can see it from this angle, a little reverse angle from the back. Let's see if he got his hands under it. Uh, maybe he did. Maybe it was his hands that it bounced up off of, not the turf. Good catch. Good that's call. That's why those wide receivers wear those white gloves, right? To show the officials that they did get their hands underneath the ball. Third down and about 11. Opening series for the Hurons. Adams under pressure, throws over the middle, and boy, was he belted in the backfield. And that's something Toledo rarely does, and that's blitz. And they came through with everybody and hit Adams. He had to throw it before the tight end even turned around, and he just threw it away to avoid the loss. Tom Gruno in there with some pressure as well, and really, as we spoke to the defensive coordinator, Ron Curtis, earlier this week, he said that Eastern Michigan, well, they wouldn't be prepared for the blitz, but Toledo doesn't blitz very often. Not very often at all, but that's when it's most effective, when they, don't, when they aren't ready for it, when they don't expect it. Back deep is number one for Toledo. He is a speedster. Renza Hughley and Ron Bonitis will kick. End over end. Hughley lets it hit at about the 34. It's in traffic. And so Toledo will start with excellent field position at about the 37. Here's a look at that offense for Toledo, led by fifth-year senior Bill Bergen. Has an extremely strong arm. And pressed into action is tailback Alan Smiley, filling in for the injured David Roars. The receivers, three very good ones. Perhaps the best, Tyler Burdick. Great hands and a great blocker. The tackles, and they're big and huge. Ken Moyer, 287 pounds on the right side. Perhaps the best guard tandem in the league, the Olsen boys. No relation to Merlin, of course. First down and 10. Toledo in a hurry. Play action pass. And quickly, in the right flat, Toledo Rockets come up with a first down, and it's John Perry, the fullback, who is not only a great blocker, but also an excellent receiver. Their leading receiver. The defense for Eastern Michigan, a little different four-man front. Defensive ends, Eric Miller, leading sacker last year, right up there this year. The tackles, Jim Hafter, only 5'9", 228, but makes big plays. That linebacker, Keith Bertram, the leading tackler. Charles Gordon, the best defensive corner. And it's safety, Tom Menard, their leader in the secondary. Hutchinson and Hughley. The wide receivers. This time, straight handoff. Smiley's got some running room. He's into the secondary. One man to beat. Menard runs him down. Finally shakes him out of bounds.
runs inside the 10, and that's the kind of play Dan Simrel was looking for early on here this evening. And who expects it from Alan Smiley? He's in for David Roars, the third leading rusher in the conference, but he makes a great cutback. Now watch this. This is I formation at its best. He just looks to see a hole. There's a man cut off at the top of your screen. He comes through, get, uses the official to help shield the defender, and then makes great cuts. You see the downfield blocking, helped him get extra yards. Smiley, a great run, and Toledo is in a position to strike first in this big game. Now let's talk about that, Stan. They've had all sorts of problems, the Toledo Rockets, that is, at punching the ball in the end zone once they get inside the 20-yard line. Exactly right. Eastern Michigan feels they have a way to do it. They go to a wishbone inside the 20-yard line. They say nobody stopped it yet. Toledo's been stopped all year long. As we said, more field goals than they do touchdowns, and that just shows that they aren't punching the ball in. This will be tough for them. It looks like we may have uh, some kind of call by the official here. They're going to back the ball up. Mike Kimberly, Mike Kimberly. Well, they're going to spot the ball at the 24-yard line. Did we get uh, a reason why? <laughs> Was there something happening at down by the sideline at the end? Looks I, like we might might have some kind of an unsportsmanlike conduct call, but the officials will gather together and determine exactly what the call is. You know, that happens when you get to a big game and exciting. The guy goes downfield, he's breaking it. You want to be a part of helping him go all the way, and you make a late block, an uncalled for block, and that's must what happened there because we watched it all the way and didn't see anything. It had to be a real late hit. I guess that's just an indication of what's happened basically to Toledo all season long. Here they bust a big play and get to inside the 10-yard line. Now they have to start first down at 10 for about the 25. Now they're outside gonna... called and it's uh, belief Kenny Moyer number 64 so again another mistake in the early go that's right now they got to start <laughs> from the 29 let alone that you got to realize it's a goal to goal from the 29 Denny it's not first down and 10 or 15 he just jumped off sides so somebody ball, ball start offense now, I don't know why he was going because there was a man in motion which meant it was not on the first sound so he shouldn't have been pulled off on that that's just a mental error but uh, that penalty being after the play was dead after the first down was made made it first and goal at the 24 now it's first and goal from the 29 that's pretty tough to score from there mm-hmm gotta pull something out of their hands Evans, the tight end, down inside the 25 to about the 21-yard line. And Jerry Evans has 4-7 speed. He's probably the quickest of the tight ends here among the Rockets. And he's a good receiver. Ten catches already for 133 yards. Just a little play action. I think we're going to see a lot of this tonight because looking at film, you can see the tight end was open in the flat time and time again if the uh, opposing uh, offense could get it to him against Eastern Michigan. I think uh, Toledo saw that, and we'll try it more tonight. Second down, goal to go now from the 21-yard line. Draw play this time, and Smiley basically gets back to about the line of scrimmage before he's finally wrapped up there by Keith Bertram. Just a good play that time by the linebacker. He stayed home. You know, your, your first reaction is when they show passes to drop, but you have to ha let the quarterback clear that tailback before you start to drop. If you drop too early, it gives him too many too much room to cut you saw what smiley did earlier when he had that room third down and 22 got to get to pay dirt bergen straight drop looks throws it out evans again and it's either a face mask or interference evans came up with a football inside the 20. Well, I'm sure Toledo hopes it's interference because that would be an automatic first down. If it's an incidental face mask, then it would just be five yards, but they would get another play. Evans obviously interested in what the officials are chatting about. It is interference. Let's see if we can see it on the replay again. There's no sense in this interference. Defense, first down. There's no sense in that. You know they got to go all the way to the end zone for a touchdown. Let him catch a three, a four, a five, even a ten-yard pass, and then make him pick a field goal. And now they get a first down in ten when before they had a first and goal from the 29. That's a big, big break for Toledo. Well, both teams have made a couple of mental errors here in the early going, but uh, it is a big football game for both teams. And obviously, uh, concentration trying to settle in a little bit. First down and ten now for the Rockets. This is their opening possession. 
Smiley off tackle dives over the stack to the 15. Well, you'll see that all night. They are a tailback-oriented offense. In fact, both of these offenses are going to go their tailback time and time again to set up the pass. Let's see John Perry. If he gets a good block, he knocks down the linebacker, opens up the hole. Smiley goes over top and gets a good four yards, which puts him down at second and six, which, from an offensive standpoint, that's what you want. you got to get at least four yards on first down. Here's a good look at Bill Bergen, the fifth-year senior. Hutchinson split out to the top of your screen. In motion now is Hughley. Second down. No score on this one in the early go. Molly bounces off one player, now ends up at about the line of scrimmage. So a nice job by the defensive interior line. Yeah, they just uh, changed that around. Now that's a win for the defense. That brings up third and six. That's a situation you want to be in defensively. You know they out almost have to surely put there to make a first down. Now don't make a pass interference if it's a short pass. It's interesting, Sam. Both teams run the ball very well, but both coaches heading into this one felt like they had to throw it well early in order to establish the run. Well, you do. If, if all you're going to do is run, you can stack your front. Uh, Eastern Michigan can play an eight-man front and shut you off. You've got to loosen them up. Third down and six for the Rockets. Yeah, it looks like maybe delay a game. And a 25-second clock ran out. That even makes it tougher. I tell you what, the percentages go up dramatically. Dramatically when it goes from third and six to third and 11. Dead you ball. see head coach delay offense. Dan Simrel. Obviously, we'll be sending in a play with Jerry Evans. Third down's been a problem for Toledo all year. They're only barely over 30% in their third down efficiency. That's not good enough to win. Uh, conversely, they give up about 40% on third downs. Now well, let's make it third down now on 11. Ball on the 20-yard line. No score in the early go from the glass bowl. <laughs> on the draw, Smiley tripped up at the ankles by number 77, Jim Hafner. It's a little bit conservative, I would think. Uh, you might as well put the ball in the air. We asked uh, Dan Stimmerl if he'd had that thought that, hey, you know, you're still not mathematically eliminated, but uh, your chances aren't real good. Do you feel like you can just go for it, let everything loose? But he said no. He was going to play it the way he always does. He just wanted a chance to win in the fourth quarter. 37-yard attempt for Bruce Nichols. Pretty much says it all thus far for the Toledo Rockets. Had an opportunity to score and jump out ahead early, and they just couldn't quite pull it off. Thing that makes it fun for them. Loosen them up, make them feel like this is going to be a fun game. I wouldn't be surprised to see something that, like that from Eastern Michigan. Don't see split backs very often. Adam straight drop. Sideline route. Gary Patton, who not only is a terrific runner, but a great receiver out to the 35. And he was wide open, you're right. Well, you don't see much more than an eye from Eastern Michigan, but we saw the uh, flat backs or split backs on that one. And he went out to the flat, and the linebacker stayed almost in the hook zone. He's got to get wider and take that flat. He's the man responsible for that. Has to be a nightmare trying to guard number 34 man-to-man. -man. Well, they're playing a zone, though, so he just had to be out there and wait for him. But he didn't get out there. He didn't get a good drop. First and ten. Second possession of the evening for the Hurons of Eastern Michigan. Had good field position on both occasions. Flag on the play. The handoff is to Chuck Nash, the freshman fullback for a couple, but it uh, looks like procedure. I think somebody moved in the interior line. That rule is once you put that hand down, you can't move it. Dead ball. False start. Offense. For the most part, Eastern Michigan on the season has done a pretty good job of staying out of trouble penalty-wise. Makes it now first down and 15. Hurons have been explosive in the opening quarter throughout the season. They've scored 73 points in the first 15 minutes. And for another straight drop. Paul had a wide open receiver right at midfield. And Mark Ziegler comes up with an excellent catch. 
That's another thing Jack Jim Harkman said he wanted to do was to be able to get his get the ball to those good wide receivers. He doesn't feel he's got it to him enough. And one of the keys when you run all these crossing patterns is to get good pass protection. We see Ron Adams with time to throw. And if we see the cross, see the tight end there sucking up the linebackers. And right behind him comes the wide receiver, Mark Ziegler, and makes the catch. First down and 10 and just across midfield for the first time this evening. Draw to Pat, not much room. Squirms and jukes and picks up five yards. And boy, did he have to work for that. That's what you call doing it on your own. And you said it right, not much room, but he made it. He looked, he looked to bounce outside. That's what he loves to do. And you can see Toledo's been well-schooled by their outside linebackers or defensive ends to make him bounce back into the middle where your friends are, where the rest of the defense is. And at least they held him to five yards. He gets around that corner, he's going to get 10 or 15. Gary Patton needs only 18 yards this evening on the ground to become EMU's all-time leading rusher. is in motion. Uh-oh, a little mix-up in the backfield. Adams has to improvise a little bit. And a big hit by Dan Vargo. Boy, he just labeled Ostrand. Well, the, the problem there is when you roll to your left, it takes you longer to set and throw the football after you make the fake. The ball's just a little late, and Benzinger takes a big hit. Now, we talked again to Jim Harkin about Benzinger. See, they run their plays in with their wide receivers. And when Benzinger's in the game, they usually run the football. He's only caught one pass all year. So he said he was going to throw a pass to him early in the game to sort of mix up that tendency that maybe somebody has. Third down now in five. 7.20 left in the opening quarter. No score. Quick pitch. Another flag. And an excellent defensive play turned in by 98, Mike McCreary. That was motion. Uh, Dan Benzinger, who we just talked about, was shifting his position as the ball was snapped. You have to be set when that ball is snapped. He was moving forward. So that's going to, I imagine they're going to decline that and bring up fourth down, make him punt the football because he was thrown for a loss of a yard anyhow. It's only a five-yard penalty, so obviously it'll put uh, Eastern Michigan in a punting situation. Motion, offense, declined, fourth down. And so the Rockets will get the football back. And thus far, Toledo's done a pretty nice job defensively in stopping Gary Patton. Well, they have. They give him a few little plays, but the key is don't give him the big ones. He's going to get some yards, but don't let him get the big chunks of yards. How come in college you never tell who did it? In pros, they always say, White, you're the guy that held him on that play. <laughs> That's because you guys got paid all that money. <laughs> but Itis to kick. This one's going to hit and take a bit of an Eastern Michigan bounce, and they'll go ahead and down it at about the 16-yard line. No score thus far. 6.54 left in the opening quarter. Coming up this Saturday on ESPN, it's a college football doubleheader, Clemson versus North Carolina. That one starts at 4 o'clock, and then, of course, later on that evening, should be a dandy, Alabama versus LSU. And don't forget, it all begins with game day. Starts at 11.30 Eastern time. Hey, that Clemson, North Carolina game, that's for the ACC championship in essence. And uh, I saw North Carolina play last week, and they're a pretty good football team. They'll give Clemson all they can handle. Better than 19,000 expected this evening at the Glass Bowl. Rockets with a football. Still no score. Bergen over the middle. He has a receiver. He's hit, and he comes up with a catch. And it's number 86, Eric Hutchinson. Again, this is the same exact pattern that Eastern Michigan completed. Watch it go over the middle and draw up the linebackers and allow Eric Hutchinson just to come to the middle of that zone and catch the football. We don't see the tight end there, but he's in front of the free safety. The tight end took the linebackers completely out of the play. One of them's got to get a little deeper and, and, and shut off that throwing lane. Career reception number 92 for Eric Hutchinson. First down and 10. Bergen again, the quick out to Hughley. Hughley wrapped up at about the 47-yard line. Just a little short hitch pattern, and Dan Bennett, uh, a freshman defensive back, fell down on the play, slipped on the turf, and gave uh, Hubley a chance. If he, watch him fall down right here. You'll see him right there. You know, he goes out, he falls down, but that's why he isn't there. If he'd have realized that and got upfield, he turned around waiting to get hit on the play. If he just turned and ran, he might have been able to break that one tackle and go for some yardage. The offensive coordinator 
Uh, Toledo is really high on number one, Renza Hughley. Say he's really starting to come into his own, and he's a big play type player. He is, and they expect more big plays out of him, both as a punt returner, a kickoff returner, and in the regular uh, phase of the offense as a receiver. And the boys up front, Tim Olson, Todd Olson. My goodness. The twin both. brothers. Yeah, 6'5 and about 260. Boy, can they play. That's uh, one of the strengths of this Rocket offensive unit. It's offensive line. They really come into their own. First down and 10. Bergen again. Same route, and guess what? Hutchinson's wide open once again. Finally wrapped up by Charles Gordon at the 30-yard line. <laughs> when you play works, make them stop you. They just came back. Eric Hutchinson, just a little in pattern. Really no moves on it all. He just comes in and cuts over the middle. You see the linebacker got better depth this time, but a good throw. You see how he just lofted the ball over the linebacker? The free safety, if you loft it that high, he's got to come up and make that play. If you make the the ball take that long to get there as a linebacker. He's got to come up and make the hit and separate the man from the ball. Hutchison averaging just a fraction better than 16 yards a catch so far this season has obviously improved on those numbers thus far tonight. Officials moving the chains and number 86 has done a nice job of doing that as well. Now you think Toledo was going for the championship tonight. First down and 10. Rockets are on the move. 5.50 left to the opening quarter. Neil Trotter on the delay. Going to bump it outside a little bit. Finally shoved out of bounds by Anthony Johnson. Still a good game. Five, six yards. Busted to the outside. That's the one thing about that eye. You never know where the play is going to break. It gives you the whole field to go. You could go from one sideline to the other. That time he went to the middle. The defensive end did not keep you play his contain rule. He came to the inside to help. You got to take care of your own position first, and he'll hear about that in the films when they watch that play. Right back to the well. Trotter tripped up inside the 20. He's only a sophomore been pressed into service because the starting tailback, number 21, David Roars, has been out all week long with back spasms. Yeah, and Alan Smiley, he's uh, playing, and he needs a break every once in a while. In fact, Trotter did most of his, he only had five carries, and most of them came against Kent State last week. Paul Winters, the offensive backfield coach for the Toledo Rockets, very high on Trotter. They said he came in last week against Kent and did a heck of a job for a guy who really hadn't played much. Stretch out the sticks, and the nose of that football means a rocket first down. And uh, don't you think that Toledo has done a pretty nice job, Stan, of mixing up the pass and the run thus far? Well, they sure had, and they've done what they said they had to do, and that's throw the ball early. Throw the ball on first and second down. Open up the lanes. Now you get the linebackers back a little bit, trying to fill that void in the middle. It really opens up the seam between the defensive linemen and the linebackers and gives those eye backs a chance to make some good cuts. Dan Simrel, head coach, 3-1 against Jim Harkema thus far. Bergen, once again, this time to the sideline, and Jerry Evans loses his feet at about the 15, just inside the 15, and uh, Evans and Tyler Burdick, the tight ends, are going to get a workout this evening. Well, this is where Eastern Michigan likes to really come with the blitz when they get inside this plus 20 area, and we, we're going to hear a lot about the plus 20 tonight. Toledo's already been down there once and didn't score, and all season long they've had that problem. This is their second opportunity. They better put points on the board because you don't get a whole lot of uh, chances. If you blow them early, you may not get him again. Counter this time, and Trotter will run the other way, and uh, near the 10-yard line, where he's finally upended there by Charles Gordon. Tell you, Scott Weicker, the linebacker, made a nice play. He was stuck there by himself with a lineman leading Trotter through the hole, and he just submarined the blocker. We'll see it right here. See the little counter play? It really hurts linebackers. They take it one step the wrong way. Now watch, he submarine the blocker and took Trotter's legs out from under him. That's a, that's a you gamble when you're in that position because you know if you just play it under normal circumstances, the guy's going to make the blocking cut. So you take a chance and you dive and you, he made the play. Boy, hemmed in at about the nine-yard line, and Dan Simrel will be faced with an interesting situation here, Stan, because he's going to have fourth down, it looks like, in very short yardage. Uh, nice play defensively by Tom Menard. Well, you learn the second time, I guess. The first time, shame on you. The second time, shame on me. He busted the outside. They held their contain. That's going to bring up a fourth down in about one. And again, inside the 20-yard line, fourth down. Evans brings in the play. Two tight ends. 
Trotter in the backfield. Hit behind the line of scrimmage, and what a play by Jimmy Hafner, 5'9", 228, and a senior, and Jim Harkema told us all about him yesterday. Again, when we made our pre-introductions to the players. 5'9", 228 pounds, but he makes the big plays. And this is the same as a turnover. When you give up the ball on fourth down, it's the same as if you fumbled it there because the other team gets the ball right there. Just a great play. Well, they've been down twice and haven't been able to score, and so it's 0-0 with 3.14 left. No one would deny. Down, non-conversion. The ball goes over to Eastern Michigan. Twice Toledo's been down there. Twice they have failed to score. That's been their problem all year. That's one of the reasons we gave why they're 3-5 and five at this point. Rockets have scored only 17 points in the opening quarter all season long. That's what's haunted them. First and ten. Going to stretch that defense a little bit. Ostrander is wide open. Knocked out of bounds by Bauscher at about the 46. Wide open. What a great fake. Everybody was sucked up looking for the tackle. Ostrander just went down the sideline on a double zone, and Fletcher never got over the top. He's the safety. He's got half the field. Now, that's the toughest place to have to go all the way to the sideline, but he's got to get there. He's got great speed. He's not even moving. But it wasn't Fletcher. Fletcher was the corner. 36-yard pass Bowser, catch. Excuse me. First down and 10. Quick pitch. Oh, my goodness. No room whatsoever along the defensive interior line. Gary Patton, first team All-MAC running back last year, and he's probably a pretty good bet to return there this year. Well, he and a kid named Wilkerson down at Kent State are the uh, two guys that are running up the big yardage totals in the MAC. Both players averaging over 100 yards a game, and both ranked in the top 25 in the country. Adam steps up, delivers this one a little bit high. Off the fingertips of Craig Ostrander. <laughs> and John Bowser said, well, I may have made a mistake on that one, but I'm going to make somebody pay for it. He just leveled Ostrander. The ball was a little high, but he'll know the next time he goes in there. Now watch this hit as he comes down right there. Boom, right in the back. That's one of those uh, next time look for me hits. You know, you know the ball is incomplete, but you get a little bit of a free shot on that one. flushed out a little bit. And he's finally tripped up from behind or did he slip down? Little slip. You know, when the field gets a little cold on AstroTurf, it tends to have a little film on it. It's tough. It starts getting slippery. And you don't realize it because there's no moisture, no rain. You don't. There's really two different type of cleats you want to wear in AstroTurf. One when it's real dry because it grips too much. And then one when it gets a little cold or a little wet that grips a little better. And I'm sure these guys aren't carrying two pairs of shoes like I always did. <laughs> Jim, I couldn't afford to slip at all. I was in trouble. Jim Harkema with a discussion with his senior quarterback, Ron Adams. Obviously, Coach Harkema saw something downfield, but Adams didn't. Benitez kicks it, and Renza Hughley pulls it in, and then gets pulled down inside the 25-yard line. So both teams have had some opportunities, but nobody has yet to cross the goal line or kick a field goal. And the flag down right to, at the scene of the action. There's also a player down over there. I think it might like be Renzo Hughley. It is uh, Renzo Hughley. And they expect some big things from him. He's only averaging a little over two yards of punt return. They feel with his speed and his ability, they should be able to get a lot more. Now they got a face mask penalty on Eastern Michigan. And I guess, I think he signaled just a five yard. He didn't give the personal foul signal 15. Hughley, one of those players, uh, just gives you the impression that every time he gets close to the ball, he's going to make a big play. No, they are marking off 15 yards now. He didn't give the personal foul, but uh, I guess Face mask, defense, first down. So the Rockets get a bit of a break. They pick up 15 yards. We'll be right back. And 
begin the first regular season NFL game on ESPN coming up Sunday night, 8 p.m. The New England Patriots and the New York Giants. And uh, who do you like in that one, Stan That's White? a tough one. Both uh, teams lost their starting quarterbacks, and you know the Giants have had trouble, and that befalls just about every team that tries to repeat as champions. Uh, but they're down to their last chance now. The Giants should come out smoking for this one. While we're on the subject of champions, should Eastern Michigan win here this evening, they'll share at least a piece of the MAC crown for the first time ever. But I think they're going to have a long night of it. Off tackle. This time it's Alan Smiley. So it's Smiley and Trotter pretty much running out of the eye back position. Well, Toledo has dominated this first quarter, but the thing is, you look at the scoreboard and it still says Eastern 0, Toledo 0 with 119 left in this first quarter. So all those yards mean nothing because there's no points up there for them. Bergen's on the move, rolls out. As a receiver, Hutchinson catches it, but he was about two steps wide of the sideline. Hutchinson's been a red-hot receiver thus far this evening, and here's a look at the problems the Rockets have had. Again, uh, Steve Haddad was a junior college transfer that came out of the spring as the second-string quarterback. He had soldier, shoulder problems, had surgery. He's out. Steve Keene started the season. He got hurt against Temple. Mark Melfi, he's been playing. He came in last week when Bergen got hurt. But uh, Bergen's been doing the best job of anybody so far this year, and he got ready tonight. It was a little bit uh, skeptical whether he would play or not. Well, it's been a rotating door. This time, Evans slips down. Ball was thrown just a fraction behind him. Menard on the coverage, but uh, had Evans come up with that play, that would have been an All-America catch. And still would have been short of the first down because the ball was thrown behind him. And so Toledo will have to punt for the first time this evening. Under a minute to play here in the opening quarter as Paul Krim will stretch out just a little bit on this cool evening. And back deep is number one, Charles Gordon, the best punt returner in the Mid-American Conference. Gordon grabs it at the 28, drops it, and then sits down on the 26-yard line. And he's averaging 10 yards a return, and you know that's a big difference. You look at Toledo averaging two yards a return, Eastern Michigan averaging 10 yards, so they gain eight yards just uh, every time they change possessions on the punt returns. That's a big difference. That's a first down. Ron Adams, the senior quarterback out of Taylor, Michigan, with 25 career interceptions. Six thus far this year. Had a tremendous year last year when he threw for 15 touchdowns. He will make things happen. Just as I say that, the bare bootleg, and he is belted out of bounds as he crosses the 30. It's a little bit of mystery why he's had the problems throwing the ball this year. Last year, over 60% completions. This year, down real close to 50% as, as his completion percentage. And you wonder why. Is it because... Both wide receivers are new. Both Ostrander and Ziegler are junior college transfers. Is getting used to the new receivers done it? I don't know. It's way into the season. They're high on those receivers. You'd think he would have a better completion percentage. Well, perhaps the defensive people have done a little better job because they know what he's capable of. Leonard Smith in motion. And this time it's the option play. Foster takes off and is whacked out of bounds by Jim Marquardt. That was the old counter option. They go towards the strong side and the wide side of the field, take a counter step and go to the short side. Everybody likes to attack the short side against Toledo because they put their strong safety to the wide side of the field, which leaves them a man short, especially on the option to the short side. They have to sort of use that sideline as the uh, as the uh, 12th man, as their support man, and get the pursuit to knock him out of bounds, but not enough. You got a first down. Again, uh oh, this one is tipped by Steve Huffman. He got a mitt up in the air, and Huffman seems to be just about everywhere. Well, a linebacker that's smart and can read play action knows where this is going to go. You know, we saw an interception we had in the pregame by Steve Huffman. The guy is a 3-3 in pre-med, a graduate. He knows where to be. He gets behind that tight end. He doesn't let him draw him up. He gets back, gets his hand on the football. Good read by Huffman. Almost, uh, and it should have been an interception. That ball goes up in the air defensively. you got to say, we got to get 90% of those. The number one tackler, Steve Huffman, for the Toledo Rockets. Little play action. 
Under pressure, steps up in the pocket and delivers, and Ziegler is wide open inside the 40, down to about the 37-yard line. Duane Fletcher in on the tackle. Eastern Michigan's pass offense is built around crossing patterns, sometimes from one side of the field to the other. You need great protection to throw those patterns. He didn't get that time. He created his own protection because he bought time for the receiver to come all the way across the field, Mark Ziegler. You can see it right here. Now, it's not great protection. They're coming after him. And look, it take, look how, much long, how long it takes for him to come all the way across the field. Not the blocking that got it, just great uh, athletic ability by Adams. Bought him time for Ziegler to come across the field and make the catch. Still no score at the end of the opening quarter, but the Hurons are on the move. Turned out in full force here this evening. No score after the opening 15 minutes. Eastern Michigan with a football. First down and 10. We're on the Rockets, 37. Foster through a big hole. Runs into the secondary, finally tripped up from behind by John Bauscher. And Stan, was that an audible that time by Ron Adams? It very well could be. He saw the blitz coming. And then Huffman showed the blitz, and he, he made a good play in taking on the fullback, but he was so deep in the backfield, when he took on the fullback, he couldn't get off of him in time to make the tackle. Now watch Huffman come through here clean. Now he hits there, he crushes the fullback, but he can't get off in time to get to the outside. It opens a big hole, and, he just, and uh, Foster went right through it for good yardage. Hurons continue to move. He'd love to score first. Jimmy Johnson into the game now at fullback and tripped up after a couple yard gain. Paul Sandor at the bottom of the stack. Well, it's now it's Eastern Michigan's turn. They're getting close to that magical 20 yard line. They've been a lot better. And we'll see when they get down there, we're going to see this wishbone, sometimes with the two tight ends and sometimes with one tight end and a wide receiver. And we heard we might even see some unbalanced wishbone tonight. And they're going to read the strong safety and figure out to go to the strong side or back to the weak side. This time it's Ziegler split out wide to the right. Ostrander flanked down to the left. Adams going to scramble a little bit. Runs past McCrary. Finally dives out of bounds inside the 10 yard line. The quarterbacks are the hardest people in the world to tackle in the open field. You see him running it there, flipping like he was going to flip the ball. You never know what those guys are going to do. A running back, you know what type of move he's going to make. He's either going to try to run over you or run around you. This guy may stop and twirl in the open field. It's just tough. Did you see uh, Mike McCreary that time try to get him in the open field? It was just like no match. Adam just went around him like he wasn't there. Well, they're going to spot the ball just outside the 10. We've got a full house back for you. The wishbone, two tight ends. Michigan trying to punch it in here. Patting to the outside, that's what they like. Shut off there, puts his head down, and boy, somebody really clamped down on him at about the 10. Well, they also saw that there was two fullbacks in the game in Patton. You know, there was Jimmy Johnson and Chuck Nash in Patton. Now, who do you think is going to get the football? You know, Patton's going to get it, and if he's lined up on the left, he can only go to his right with the football, and that's exactly what happened. If you're smart defensively, you can pick up things like that. That's why they need to have both their tailbacks, Fisher, I mean Foster and Patton, at those two halfback positions, so you, you don't know defensively which side they're going to go. Both defenses have done a pretty gutsy job of keeping the other offenses out of the end zone. Oh, they cross things up this time. Foster's got some running room, and he's going to get to the goal line for the touchdown. And I think, crossed things up, I think Jimmy Johnson went the wrong way. Not one who crossed him up. He went one way, and they went sweep the opposite side. They confused the defense so badly that he just walked in the end zone. Again, two fullbacks and Foster. You, feel, you, you got to figure Foster's going to get the ball. Tim heading it on to try the extra point. Adams will hold, so it's Eastern Michigan who scores first here. on the kick, so it's an opening score for the Hurons. They lead 7-0. 
ESPN's presentation of college football is being brought to you by the 1988 German engineered Volkswagens and your Volkswagen dealers. And by GTE. G, no, GTE. And the Rocket fans, well, those are Eastern Michigan rooters, better than a thousand who came down from Ypsilanti to root their Hurons on the Road Warriors. They sure are. The Road Warrior buses, about 40 of them came down with close to 1,500 of their fans, and uh, they have shown their support, and they've been rewarded with a 7 to nothing lead thus far. Smiley and Hublick back deep, and Smiley lets it hit in front of him, picks it up at the 10. Gets one block, throws his shoulder through one player and ends up at the 26. Let's go back and look at that touchdown play. Again, the wishbone. Watch him go. I think he goes the wrong way here. It's a counter play. No, it isn't. It's a counter play with the guard pulling. It just completely fooled everybody on the right side of the line. Both backs went one way. The guard pulled around, so he didn't go the wrong way. Just a counter play, something they had not shown out of that wishbone. It was either toss right, toss left hand right or hand left so it really confused not only me but the Toledo defense 73 yards and that's the first score of the evening Bergen play action wide open Tyler Burdick and he draws a crowd at about the 32 and that's that tight end in the flat that's open all day on the play action against uh, Eastern Michigan they seem to give away that flat quite often you won't believe this, but Tyler Burdick, number 88, enjoys cliff diving. Stan? I wouldn't believe it, because I wouldn't enjoy it. <laughs> Not on the way down, anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that catching those passes over the middle's got to be a breeze compared to that. That's nothing like hitting the rocks, is it? <laughs> oh, brother. Second down and four. On the delay. Smiley with a nice move, but handcuffed by Jerry Smith. One too many moves. He started to go in, then out, then back in. And by that time, uh, Jerry Smith had the time to get up off his block because he was actually on the ground and then get up and sort of shoot the legs out from under the as running a, back, Smiley. As a defensive player, Stan, what's the key to stopping that sweep? Well, you got to first contain it. You got around the contain it, made the uh, defensive back come up and make the tackle. But again, that's the short side where you're weaker now. Well, plenty of room to run, but he elects to throw, and Hughley comes up with a great catch at about the 46. I think Bergen could have probably run easy for the first down. I tell you, Brian Carter took a gamble there. He went to cut in front and try to make the interception. Luckily, he just got one hand on Renza Hughley to keep him because he goes down the sideline with that speed. He's gone. Watch this. Another little play action sprint to the right. Usually just goes down and does a real quick out pattern. Now watch the break by Brian Carter. He goes to go in front, and then he gets that hand just on that left hip and pulls him out of bounds. 11.24 left in the opening half. Huron's lead 7-0. Draw play. Smiley hit three times. First player to get a piece. Number 72, Mike Bass. Scott Jurek. And on the stop for the Hurons. Brings up second down now in nine. Passing situation. See if they go that play action out of the eye. We talked to uh, Dan Simmerl. That's all they ever run is the eye because of their quarterback problems having so many. They didn't want to put in anything else. They wanted to stay basic. Bergen's done a nice job of throwing the ball thus far this evening. Evans comes up. And makes the catch and then drops it right at about the 49. So he had it in his hands and just couldn't hang on. Well, that time the corner, instead of going deep, jammed the wide receiver and covered that flat zone. They tried to go the tight end there. That's the one the quarterback has to read it. Watch the corner come up there again, Brian Carter. He just lets him go and covers the flat and hits the tight end in the back. In fact, that's a fumble. And then he recovered. That should have been a completion. He came down both feet with the football. Then Carter hit him in the back, and the ball popped out. They called it incomplete. They do that a lot of times to avoid controversy. But that very well should have been a fumble. Rockets one for four in third down conversions this evening. Play action. Bergen has the receiver. Burdick comes down with a football, but he's going to be probably about a yard short of the first down. 
He is. He's got to know where the first down marker is. When you're that tight end coming over the middle and just hooking up, you want to hook up at the first down marker. There's no sense in hooking up a yard or two yards or three yards short of it. You know, you hope you can catch the ball and break a tackle and make a first down, but you're better off knowing you got it when you catch the football. Well, Toledo elects to punt the football away. Charles Gordon back deep at about the 10. Good pressure, and oh my, what a dandy of a kick. Fair catch by Gordon at about the 13. So the Hurons get the football back, and they own a 7-0 lead. Ball on the ESPN. Every Saturday, America's hardest-hitting roster of nationally ranked powers provides exciting action on television's best college football schedule. The mighty Clemson Tigers take on North Carolina. Then Alabama battles LSU in a live CFA doubleheader Saturday, starting at 4 Eastern on ESPN. And, of course, it all starts with CFA game day at 11.30 on Saturday. 7-0. Huron's on top, and they took advantage of an opportunity and drove it 73 yards. Meanwhile, they're now back inside their own 15-yard line. one yard line and he is just sneaky quick he sure is and I think that carry will probably put him uh, over the top as far as being the leading rusher in history of Eastern Michigan uh, he need 18 yards and I think that puts him well over 20 at this point watch those look at those wide line splits that opens up the hole on the eye you see that they played it pretty well but gaps are there just on alignment you have to start shooting the gaps to beat that Mike Strickland held the record previous but now Gary Patton the NU's all-time leading rusher this time, though, it's the give to the fullback, the freshman Chuck Nash, who grinds out a couple of yards to about the 25. Huffman sticks his helmet in on the play. He, of course, is the number two tackler in the MAC, averaging better than 16 tackles a game. He's a busy linebacker. Yeah, he's in on everything, has interceptions, pass breakups. We saw one of those tonight where he tipped the ball, tackles for loss. And uh, Chuck Nash is an interesting story, though. 5'9", 235, a true freshman walk-on starting in the game that determines uh, a share of the MAC championship. Reminds me of a friend of yours, Don Nottingham, about the same size, huh? That's right. Adams with a play action. Oh, he zips it out to Ziegler. Ziegler turns the corner. Finally knocked out of bounds by Dwayne Fletcher. And uh, you have to be impressed with Adams' arm. Well, he has a great arm. Again, you see the tight end crossing and bring up the man in the flat, which gives him plenty of time to throw the ball, a big gap to throw the ball down the sideline. So he just runs down and does an out pattern. Fletcher's got to play a little bit closer at that. He gets him turned. When you get those shoulders turned, it's tough to make that, that move. Then he even falls down. And lucky he didn't get more than he did. But he got the defensive back out of his back pedal and got his, his shoulders turned. Then if you make an out, you know you got him beat. This time it's Ostrander in motion. Patton hit in the backfield. But still ends up with better than 10 yards and knocked down at about the 45. Again, that's his forte, bouncing the play. You never know where that where it's going to go, but he loves to bounce outside. There you see Eastern Michigan's all-time leading rusher. He just is going to break that every time he carries the football the rest of the, this season, the end of his career. Needed only 38 yards this evening to rush for over 1,000 yards for the second consecutive year. Got to be close to that now after those last two runs. That pretty much says it all. Jim Harkham begging for a timeout, and he gets it. So with 8.22 left here in the first half of play, it's the Huron 7 and the Rockets nothing. Dan? I don't know. Is that Christmas? What is that? <laughs> Maybe that is the Rocket Man. Maybe Dan Simmerl isn't the Rocket Man. <laughs> oh. Well, they're here to enjoy this evening, but thus far the Rocket fans. That might well, be Dan Simmerl way it looks like if they don't score next time they get inside the 20. <laughs> Waiting for the Rockets to launch themselves. Patton on the delay. No. Play action all the way. Oh, Strander. Oh, oh he had it and dropped it at the one. <laughs> That's the play. You bring him down and have him clear out that strong at uh, free safety to hit that in pattern all day then you see the free safety start to jump up on the short man 
only the great speed by Dwayne Fletcher allowed him to get back and really shield it. He didn't get a piece of it. He just shielded the eyesight of the wide receiver, Craig Ostrander. He didn't touch it, but he got in the vision line, and he wasn't able to hold on to the football. His wide receiver coach is going to tell him he should have caught that ball, and then he's going to be right. Second down and 10. What a great throw. Right on the button. This time, Patton does get it. Boy, ran right to the line of scrimmage. Nothing there. Shifted direction and picked up three or four yards. Again, he bounced outside. He loves to do that. You just got to play. When you're an outside man, you got to stay there. Let's watch here if they see if they stay at home. Little game. He really busted through there. Now, see the, watch him. He just stays at home right there. Now, luckily, he, the other man comes back because he went inside. He got his nose in there again. He can't do that. He's got to stay inside. Mike McCreary's got to stay, I mean, excuse me, outside and make Patton go inside where the rest of the linebackers are coming from. You can understand that. <laughs> oh, that was simple. <laughs> Backs were split. Blitz is on. Patton on the run. And he is rolled out of bounds by John Boucher at about the 38-yard line. Tell you what, good open field tackle on a very dangerous man. If you're an offensive uh, coordinator, you want to get that situation. Patton catching a short pass off the blitz with a free safety having to come from the middle of the field all the way up and make that tackle. Luckily, Bowser got there just as the ball did because if you don't get there quick enough and give him room, he's going to make you miss, and that means he can go all the way. Renza Hughley back deep at about the 10. Ron Bonitas will kick it for Eastern Michigan. Pulls it in at about the 16. 7-0 Hurons on top. He drove 73 yards. The final 11 reeled off by Bob Foster. Hennigan with the extra point. And Eastern Michigan out ahead in the opening half of play. He's been solid so far. Eight out of 11. Couldn't ask for much more than that. Just no points. <laughs> Quick drop. Look over the middle. Two pump fakes. Uh-oh, that one's in a crowd. Yeah, you can't do that. You could not throw late deep over the middle. <laughs> you saw how many white shirts were around that football. They went to the double zone, which means uh, both corners rotate up and the two safeties have half the field. The play that defeats that is the tight end down the middle because they're split. And if you can get the ball just over the linebackers before the safety can make the play, it defeats that, that zone defense. But he was held up at the line of scrimmage, and that's why he was pumping. He kept waiting for him to get deep. He never got there. Linebackers did a good job. Second and 10, quick pitch. Trotter tries the left side, and not much happening over there. Scott Weicker with a really solid hit. 37 tackles on the year. Make it 38 now for number 98. Good pursuit by the inside linebacker. So we got to play it inside out on that eye formation toss because they're looking to cut it back. Don't ever kid yourself every time. They're looking to cut that back and find a hole. Third and nine, and it's time to be careful back here. Bergen with time to throw. Oh, my. He threaded the needle, and Hutchinson hauled it in at about the 34. And are they going to give it to him? Let's see. Yep. They're going to give it to him. And that, that was a dangerous throw, but a great throw. I guess there's a fine line between the two. I guess it's a great throw when it's completed. But watch. There's four white jerseys around. And here's everybody on top of him. Look at them all here. One, two. Just missed knocking it down. There's three, four coming from the other direction threw right into a crowd, but uh, the old needle in the haystack was at the right spot that time. 5.57 left here in the first half, and uh, those are some impressive numbers, averaging better than 20 yards a catch for the senior out of Dayton, Ohio. All three the same pattern, just a little in pattern. Not much of a move, but you don't make a lot of moves against zone. You want to get the spot. Boy, any kind of points whatsoever would be a blessing in disguise for the Toledo Rockets before the halftime gun. Trotter hits the hole, jammed up there about the 36. 
Keith Bertram in on the tackle. He is EMU's top tackler on the season with 63 heading into this game tonight. And here's our little defensive lineman again, 5'9", 228. Just stands up a bigger man, sheds the uh, blocker, and comes in to make a tackle. That's picture-perfect defensive line play. You, that's the advantage of being small, though, is you can get under those offensive linemen, stand them up, and then shed them, get rid of them, just like you did. Bergen again. Oh, what a beautiful throw. We've got a flag on the play as Hughley dumped out of bounds as he crossed the 40. Well, they must have called that he hit him while the ball was in the air. The only thing I can figure out. Yeah, it looked like he might have touched him a tad soon because the flag was thrown, right? <laughs> no, no, oh, no, no, no. They're they... calling offensive interference. I think that's one of those, uh, I think it's time to make that call. Yeah, we'll see if he pushed off on the break, huh? Yeah, I guess that's what we're going to call. I didn't see it looking straight at it. We're right in front of the play. But, uh, of course, we're watching the ball in play. Pass interference, too. offense, lost the down. That's a big penalty. Well, obviously, Hughley pushed off on the out pattern. But you're right. It sure did look like it from up here. Yeah, it didn't at all. Aren't you glad you're not an official, though, Stan? I've always been glad I wasn't an official. Because <laughs> I was always yelling at him. Right? There you go. <laughs> I wouldn't like guys like me that was yelling at officials. But uh, you almost have to, you know, really get the edge keep them honest that's what everybody tries to get that edge by yelling at officials some it works on some it doesn't tough to hide out there too with those striped jerseys on you know <laughs> there's just nowhere sure. to go and Dan Simrel obviously uh, going to call a timeout here because uh, the Rockets hadn't had a chance to get the offensive play in and uh, now is not the time to make a mistake because they trail seven nothing <laughs> football preview on-site reports from major showdowns exclusive interviews with top coaches unbeatable predictions live Saturdays on ESPN Dan Simrel right now is a little bit warm on this cool evening at the glass bowl simmering you could say I guess at that point because he was he's even hotter than that he was screaming at the official third down and a bunch Get it done, John Perry. Dragged a couple of people with him. Hafner, I believe. Yeah, Hafner. I tell you, that guy's so quick when he makes his moves. He can either get under you, or he can go around you. We've seen the examples of both. He just hit uh, Perry right in the backfield, and he hung on and yelled for help. Trim the punt. Little pressure. Gordon at the 48. Hemmed in, finally knocked down, ball squirts loose. And I think the Hurons are going to come up with it. Luckily, because it really came out of there. Good move by Gordon, but you can't cough it up like that, not at midfield. This is great field position. They got the ball in Toledo's territory, leading 7 to nothing. Four minutes and 19 seconds left in the half. It's a great opportunity to take a big lead into halftime. See the ball come out here. We couldn't, we saw the hit, the ball just popped out. Luckily, they're uh, real alert to fall on the football. Usually the defense is the one looking because the other guys are looking to block and not looking for the football. Golden opportunity, and there we see the wishbone. Unbalanced right. Down the line comes Ron Adams. Turns it upfield. He's still running with a football inside the 25. Flag thrown on the play right at the end, and uh, there might have been a little face mask. We'll see what it is, but we were looking for that, that unbalanced wishbone, what they were trying to do. And we do have a personal foul. That's going to take it to half to the halfway to the goal line from the 24. It'll be down at the 12-yard line. I tell you what, uh, we were waiting for this wishbone unbalanced. Dead ball, personal foul, defense. Personal foul against Toledo. 
And you can see that the, what this does, it gives you an extra man over there. you got to go out and play the wide receiver. It takes away the man who's going to take the quarterback or the pitch. They chose to guard the pitch man. That left Adams a free lane to run. And he's almost as dangerous as if you give it to Patton. Well, last week he scrambled for a pair of touchdowns from 45 and 38 yards out. So he can turn it upfield and take it to the end zone. Unbalanced left this time. Once again, it's Adams. Nobody stepping up, and Adams is going to dash into the end zone. Again, they're waiting to see if they didn't bring a man over on that unbalanced to help overload it. They were going to continue to run to the, to the strong side of the unbalanced. Again, he just walks in. This is what they call walking the dog here. He just makes a fake. The fullback does a good job of after he fakes, sealing the inside. But Adams just runs in there with no buddy there to make a tackle. I mean, I don't know where they were, but uh, that unbalanced wishbone, and I'm, I'm sure he's going to keep running until they make some type of adjustment. Well, he's supposed to be a thrower, but that's his fourth rushing touchdown of the season, the third in the last couple of weeks. He's made all the difference thus far in this one. Hold is good, kick is up, and Hennigan adds the extra point, so Eastern Michigan takes advantage, Stan, of the great field position, and boy, they took it down the field in a hurry. Well, Eastern's been down there twice, and Toledo's been down there twice, and the score is Eastern 14, Toledo nothing, so the exact same problem that has been Dan Simro and Toledo's problem all year long remains that. They get down there, they get their opportunity, yet they don't uh, get any points out of it. Rockets doing anything but give up on that sideline. And of course, coming up at halftime, interesting. Because you'll see a feature on Todd Santos passing for Kevin Sweeney's all-time NC2A record. Also a quarterback called Gramps and scores and sports news. Obviously, Tim Brando running the show back in Bristol. <laughs> and the quarterback named Gr Gramps, was he one of those guys that played in the replacement games? So <laughs> you can see, here's the unbalanced to the left. They just run it. There's a fullback sealing the inside. They had the pitch covered, but there was nobody there because of the extra wide receiver on that side that they had to honor in case of a passing situation. Nobody was there to take the quarterback. The pitch man had to take had to make the choice. Do I take the quarterback, let him toss it to the tailback, or do I take the pitch man, let the quarterback run it, and hope that the inside pursuit can make the play? You almost have to do it that way because he's closer to the inside and hope the pursuit can come in there and make the play. They Hur didn't. Huron's leading now by two touchdowns. 3.48 left in the opening half, and the Rockets, as they have for most of the season, are going to have to find a way to come back from behind. Short kick. And there's a mix-up. The ball is on the carpet, but I believe Smiley fell on it at the last moment. Yep, off the bottom of the stack. In the right spot at the right time was Alan Smiley. Well, that deep man's got the call, and he's like an outfielder coming in. He has precedence. He's got to tell him, I got it. You go up and block. The man up front is never supposed to go backwards to make a catch on that front line. But he was almost in his spot, and the bag behind him had to say, hey, I can get it. You go block. He probably didn't get the communication from the deep man. Really. Rockets have 346 left in the first half. They're going to have to get things done in a hurry. Perry falls down. Ball thrown a touch behind him, and John Perry can't come up with a reception. Yeah, three or four times Bergen has had problems throwing to that left flat when he has to turn his body and throw out to the left. The right flat, he's getting the ball there, but when he goes left and throwing across his body, the ball's coming up short. The tight end a couple times had to stop and come back. Now this time the fullback. He's just got to let the ball fly going that direction. Perry has been his favorite receiver thus far this year. Perry with 20 receptions out of the backfield. Back to the tailback and Smiley. Tries the right side, ends up at about the 27. The problem now Toledo has is they have one offense, an I formation offense. They get behind too much. It's really tough to come back when you're a running team. You don't have that second phase you can go into, that passing offense that you can go into, because when you get way behind, play action's not going to fool anybody. They need to score, get some points on the board before halftime. They got three minutes left. Need a first down here just to hang on to the football. Well, this 
time Hughley gathers it in, and it's more than enough for the first down, so they'll move the sticks out to about the 43. And again, that time he went to his left, rolled to his left, and threw on the go and made a good throw. This is a tough throw. This is one of the toughest you're ever going to make, and Bergen made it well. You see, the cornerback never turned his shoulders and made a good break coming back, but he got his body between him and the corner, Uli did, and was able to shield him and make the catch. Bergen did a nice job of releasing the ball before the cut was really even made. Held it down at the 44 after a gain of a couple. Well, again, the clock has uh, got to start to play a part in all the decisions on play calling. 2.40 left in the first half. Uh, they're not even to midfield yet. You've got to start uh, picking up some more chunks of yardage if you're going to score before halftime, and they really need to do that. Bergen with a pump fake, and then he's dragged down from behind. Eric Miller with the sack behind the line of scrimmage. Led the team in sacks last year, and that uh, puts him in to the team lead now this year. Four and a half sacks. Mike Burns was leading with four sacks. So the guy's a consistent player. He continues to rush, continues to put pressure on. All four of those guys are right around three and a half, four sacks, two and a half on the season. So they all four continue to put that pressure on. And the defensive interior made up basically of senior players. Well, pass incomplete for Isaiah. And Charles Gordon was draped over Rick Isaiah like the curtains in the living room. Well, the question was, was he draped uh, a little bit too early on that one? That was close to being pass interference, but the ball may have been tipped. No, it wasn't tipped. Uh, no, I wouldn't call that. It was just uh, on his legs. That was more incidental contact. I think it was a good play by the, by the defensive back, Charles Gordon. Now he's going to return the punt. He's a busy man. Grimm with an end over end kick. Gordon at the 27. A little nifty move across the 35 to about the 37 where he's wrapped up. 141 left in the opening half. And the Hurons lead 14 nothing. Come with a football and a two touchdown lead as we near the end of the second quarter. Do you think that uh, the Hurons will load it up here, Stan? Well, I think they're going to go back, and they do. Unbalanced wishbone. They haven't stopped it yet. And I just keep running until Toledo makes an adjustment. If they do, come back to the weak side. The same play that they scored the touchdown on. Ball squirts loose. Mark Ward has it, loses it, and then gathers it back in at the 29. That was not smart. He should have just fell on it because you can't advance the fumble. That's why he lost it the first time. Luckily, he got it back. But that's a huge play for Toledo because now they get the ball with a minute 28 left in the half on the 37-yard line, and they can put some points on the board. Well, maybe they can. <laughs> Toledo, the number one team in the conference in turnover ratio. Yeah, and they're 12th in the country, as a matter of fact. And Eastern Michigan is also proficient at that, 15th in the country in turnovers. So he should have tried to pick that up and run. He just should have put a foul on because you can't advance it anyhow in college. Uh-oh, this is not eye formation. Nope, four wide receivers. Blitz. Oh, and Bergen slips and falls at the 47. Bergen, the ball carrier. Well, talk about uh, letting the air out of the balloon, huh? Well, they had him in a blitz, and it was a late blitz because they went on quick count. They may have had somebody open if he had just stayed on his feet. It's almost that bare defense, huh? Send more people than they can block. Here they come. Bergen gets it off. Pass thrown behind Lorenzo Hugo. Well, there's no doubt when you spread it out like that, you got four wide receivers, you can send more than they can block, and that's what Eastern's done the first two times. But the key there is, if they can get it off and get it to somebody, and one guy misses a tackle, the guy's gone. Because you only have man-to-man -man on four guys, and they're running all over the place looking at somebody else. This time, Eastern plays coverage. And Ricky Isaiah comes up with a heck of a catch inside the 35. He'll be about five yards short of the first down, but that gets a big chunk of it. They got plenty of time. They don't have to be in such a hurry that they're going to hurt themselves. They have 50 seconds and two timeouts left, so they shouldn't be. Yeah, it is fourth down and about five to go, and they shouldn't be uh, in too much of a hurry. They should have called a timeout and huddled. 
Here comes the rush. Bergen. He scrambles loose. And Isaiah Hannon dropped it at about the 22, and then he got dropped in the secondary. A big hit by Menard. And he made Bergen made a great play to get away from the first man and buy time. But Isaiah just could not hold on to the football. Again, they come with a blitz. You can see the extra man right there comes through. Number 98, Scott Weika, blitzing linebacker. He just misses Bergen. Now watch this. A good throw on the run. He's wide open. A little bit behind him, but you've got to make that catch. You know, that's the difference between scoring points and not scoring points, obviously. So with 37 seconds left in the opening half, Eastern Michigan regains control. Rockets really had a chance. Delay on the draw. Foster's loose. Finally grabbed at the 45. Now they make some yardage. Now they do call a timeout. That's right. If they wouldn't have made any yardage, they'd probably run out the clock. They already fumbled once. They don't want to give Toledo a real opportunity. But now they're up close to midfield. A little bit uh, safer area to try some things. Now they can put the ball up, put the ball in the air. And even if it's intercepted, it's going to give them 60 or 70 yards to go for Toledo. And there won't be enough time. Huffman heads to the sidelines for some instructions from defensive coordinator Ron Curtis. And there you see the storyline thus far. Well, that's exactly what we talked about. The tailback rushing, 85 to 66. Not a great big difference there. That's not the difference. But look at quarterback, 52 to minus 13. Going into this game, there was a 65-yard per game difference in the productivity of the quarterbacks. Now you already got, what is that, uh, 65. They've already got enough. What they <laughs> usually do in a game, they've done this first half. And then the key one, Toledo, two possessions inside the 20-yard line. No points. Also, when you consider the quarterback situation, Ron Adams also has a touchdown run. Exactly, and that's that's the difference. We talked about it before. They don't have a Ron Adams that can also run with the ball as well as throw the ball efficiently. And that's the difference. The key positions they have just better athletes at. Eastern Michigan does. Ostrander split out wide to the right. First and 10, 29 seconds left. Foster again scoots through a hole, crosses midfield to about the 48, and Huffman once again with the tackle. Yeah, defensively, you can take your time. Don't get up too quick. 15 seconds left. Huron's in a hurry, and very quickly, Adams whistles this one to the brick wall at about the 45. Well, John Lopp, who is the long field goal kicker for Eastern Michigan, booted a 70-yard field goal in practice a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, Or so they say. Is, it, <laughs> is he within range, Stan? <laughs> well, if he can kick it 70, he is. He's uh, right now, uh, was he 60, uh, close to uh, 67 yards, would it be back there if he went back from the 50? And, of course, stay tuned for a sensational halftime report. Tim Brando standing by. Nine seconds left. Adams with a pump fake. Home run ball. Picked off, then dropped and caught in the end zone by Ziegler. Oh, oh, oh my. No time left on the clock. Hennigan will come on to try the extra point, and disaster has struck here in the glass bowl in the form of a long touchdown pass that probably should have been an interception. Mm. In and out of the hands of the secondary man, and Ziegler gobbled it up. Hennigan with the extra point. So with no time left on the clock, the Hurons now lead 21-0 on the 49-yard touchdown pass. Hey, you remember the earlier one that he sealed him? He didn't make the catch. Watch this when He bounces off his helmet. Look at that concentration. He follows the football, gathers it in with one hand, touchdown, nail in the coffin, 21 to nothing at halftime. What? Just look at that. Just great concentration. He kept his eye on the football. That's tough to do when you got all those defenders coming down. But again, you know it's the last play of the first half, and it takes a miracle, and they got one right there. You look back at that drop fourth down pass by Isaiah now. 
Look how much that might have been, 14 points. Third touchdown for Ziegler, and the only guy that could make a better catch than that would probably be Tim Brando back in Bristol, Connecticut. All right, thank you, Denny. I hope I don't fumble here. By the way, we've got an interesting halftime show coming up here on the Coca-Cola halftime scoreboard. Will Derek Finner become a Tar Heel, and has Norby Walters struck again? All of that coming up on the Coca-Cola halftime scoreboard. At halftime, Eastern Michigan, the Hurons leading the Rockets by 21 at the Glass Bowl. Stay with us. Halfway home, halfway towards clinching at least a share of the MAC football title as they lead Toledo 21 to nothing here at halftime at the Glass Bowl. And Ron Adams has been the difference thus far in this one, Stan. He's been outstanding. And he has. It's not just throwing the football. He's been good there, but running the football. Watch right here. They put in the unbalanced wishbone attack, and they went right down the field with Adams carrying the football and carrying it without getting touched. Again, the extra man, they did not make an adjustment. Toledo didn't. If they do, you watch, they'll go back the other way on Toledo if they move a man over. Now, here's the last play of the half, and this is, uh, this is a sin defensively. First, you can't let a man get behind you like that. you got to line up on the end zone. Why, why even be close? You know it's the last play of the half. Then great concentration by Mark Ziegler. Ball bounced up in the air. He comes down with it. A Hail Mary. It was answered. But again, defensively, Dan Vargo should be lined up at the five-yard line and then backpedal to the end zone and just make everything happen in front of you. If you had to make a tackle, so what? Give him the yardage. But he had to run backwards, and then when he did, he lost his balance and it bounced off of him for the touchdown. So the Rockets have pretty much dug themselves a deep hole. If you look at the offense, though, from both teams, the passing has been pretty good. Yeah, it has. Uh, it's pretty close there. 168 yards to 154. Adams, the difference, and we talked about it, the difference there is in Adams' ability to run the football and also the tailback. That's a difference in the rushing yards, 149 to 56. Two better athletes at tailback and at quarterback for Eastern Michigan. Then you add. You look at one turnover there for Eastern Michigan. There's only one turnover. You talk about Toledo. They really had two turnovers because they got inside the 20 and they didn't score. Those are turnovers to me. If you get down there and you lose the ball on downs, it's the same as a fumble. Let's take a look at basically what happened scoring-wise for Eastern Michigan in the first half of play. The first one capped. An 11-yard run by Bob Foster. And, Stan, you mentioned the fact they don't lose anything at all when they take Patton out. They sure don't. And he can go inside. He goes inside even tougher than Patton does. And they like this kid. You know, he's the guy that's going to replace Patton. Then the big touchdown by Adams, which made it 14 nothing. And uh, then we mentioned the disaster defensively right before the halftime gun. A 49-yard touchdown pass from Adams to Ziegler. So it's 21-0, and the Rockets have found themselves in this position a number of times this year, Stan, and, well, it's got to look pretty familiar to them now. Well, it sure does. If you take away that last drive, which is, say, around 60 yards or so, 49 touchdown, a couple runs before that, the yardage is pretty much, it's not a whole lot of difference. Maybe about 210 to 250 if the score is 14 to nothing without that last drive, and yet they've had the same amount of yardage up and down the field. And you hate to be redundant, but at the same time, the Rockets with two great opportunities to score and to score first in this one. This evening, they come up with nothing. That does make a difference when you score first. Here we have a... Kurt, we got we have a 15-yard penalty for something here. I didn't see it, but they're kicking off from the 20-yard line. They wouldn't get an explanation. I don't know why that is, but they're, the ball's lined up on the 20. Was there a, maybe a celebration penalty at the end of the first half? That must be it on that long touchdown. That's the only thing I can figure out. That's 15 yards. Either that or there was an unsportsmanlike conduct call on the extra point, I believe, the extra point kick, just as we went to halftime. And so it's tacked on to begin quarter number three. So with Renza Hughley back deep along with Alan Smiley, the Rockets are going to have to get on the pad in a hurry here in the third quarter of play because if they don't, the Hurons may just march this one right back to Ypsilanti. Well, they kick off rather short. They should get great field position now. Hughley at the 28. Oh, my. Big hit. He fumbled the football, and it ricochets out of bounds. And Eastern Michigan with a near opportunity. Menard almost pulled it in, but the Rockets come up with a big break on the opening play. Yeah, you may wonder. Eastern Michigan did touch it last, but it's possession that matters. Toledo had last possession. The ball goes out of bounds. It goes back to the team with that last possession. So they get a big break there. They, that guy should just slow down and, uh, and got on the football because it was all Eastern Michigan to make the recovery. Not a bad first half for Bergen. 12 of 20 for over 150 yards, but no points. 
first half. Here we go. Look out for the pass. Isaiah lets it go, and Hughley had it and dropped it, and I think Menard got into his vision right at the last moment. They ran that play and practiced three or four times on Tuesday, and it worked. And here, I think if Isaiah could have thrown it far enough, it might have been a touchdown. It still should have worked. You still got to catch the football on that. They watch it. He just stops on the end around. They've run ends around five times this year to Benzinger. Now Isaiah gets it. Now watch. He just happened. No, it did touch off the man. Yep. Did touch off the man. Isaiah, I mean, uh, usually may have been better off coming back, not waiting for it like that. You got to go up after the ball when you you got to be the jump ball situation. You go up and get it. If you wait to catch it in your hip pocket, something's going to happen before it gets there. That's what happened on that one. Tom Menard with two interceptions already on the year. I think actually flicked it with his face mask at the last moment. He was beaten on the play, but Isaiah, who was a flanker and not a quarterback, just a little short on the throw. Was a quarterback in high school, though. That's right. Played at Copley High School about five minutes from where I live near Akron, Ohio. Smiley puts his head down, runs past the 50, tackled by Keith Bertram as he crosses the 50 down to about the 48. It's been a season of near misses for Toledo. And that was just another near miss on that play. Good play to start the second half. Oh, yeah. Could have uh, could have really inspired this team if they had been able to pull it off. Smiley was 60 yards thus far in 11 carries. Sprint draw again, and Smiley's got some room. He beats Menard, and he's finally dragged down from behind inside the 30. And that may have been an audible by Bergen. He saw the blitz and knew where the weakness of that blitz was. You got Smiley through that wave, that first wave of the blitz, and you get through there. That means the only guy coming up is this free safety to make the tackle. You can watch him coming up on the play right here. Tom Menard, he has to come up, and then he's blocked. He luckily gets uh, some help and brings him down from behind. They went. Good play call. Mix some things up. Bergen had Perry wide open at the 25, but threw it wide. Again, out to the flat. He's had his problems. Usually throwing to the right, he's done pretty well. But watch him. Watch how far behind the receiver this is. You got to lead him. That's uh, you're lucky you don't get that picked off. You throw short to the flat, you're liable to get a guy breaking in front and going all the way with it. Bergen has yet to throw a touchdown pass this year, and now would be an opportune time to come up with one. Little counter this time by the tailback. And finally wrapped up by Bertram. Just underway here in the second half. It is 21-0. Eastern Michigan on top. Euron's exploded for 21 points in the second quarter. See, good yardage by Smiley. He's running the ball well. I mean, they're doing what they have to do, but they're just not scoring. And that's the one thing we said they had to do. Well, you just get the feeling if they ever do, the floodgates will open. They put a bunch of points on the board against Miami a couple of weeks ago. Blitz all out. Bergen reads it, gets it to Hughley. He gathers it in, falls down, but he's inside the 15. Boy, I tell you what, if he wouldn't have bobbled it, he would have turned up the field and gone all the way. It would have been a touchdown pass. Well, I know you spent many a halftime listening to Woody Hayes give you the old uh, college try speech. You think the Rockets can pull one off here? <laughs> well, they need to get a quick score, that's for sure. And uh, Woody sometimes just didn't say anything. He just went in there and... Uh, let you know how he felt in other ways. That had to be a lot worse, huh? <laughs> yeah. You, you wish he started talking. <laughs> First down and ten. Rockets are on the move, and boy, do they need to reach the pay dirt. Smiley cuts it up through a hole and gets near the ten-yard line. Well, they're inside the 20 again here, Denny. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're, they're 0 for 2. This is the third time. 21 to nothing, Eastern Michigan with uh, 12.50 in the third quarter and they need to put some points on quick you just have to wonder what might have happened in this game had they scored the first time they took it down the field well, you, that's something you'll never know because it changes every play call the rest of the time when you're behind or ahead from behind at the 15. Louis Cafazzo came up 
with the sack behind the line of scrimmage. Boy, and he had some room to run. He kept waiting. Perkins, a guy that doesn't like to run. The Adams would have been gone in a second. But here, if he just would have noticed it just a fraction of a second, breaks that tackle, he's down inside the 10 easily, maybe down to the 5 and a first down. Now it's a big third down and 10 yards to go on the 15. Quick snap. Bergen has time to set up. Going to the end zone. He's got Hughley. Oh, ball nearly picked off in the secondary by Dan Bennett. Hughley was open for a moment, but Bennett made a nice break yeah, on the football. Looked wide open. Bennett almost was hiding in the corner of the end zone. All of a sudden, you looked up and said, boy, what a move. He's wide open. Then all of a sudden, when the ball came down, Dan Bennett had just waited in his zone, waited for Hughley to come to him. So now he's going to try to have to try to field goal, which is, again, not a touchdown. Bruce Nichols missed on a 37-yard attempt in the first quarter of play. This will be a 32-yarder. And it's good. So the Rockets finally remove that goose egg from the scoreboard as Nichols kicks field goal number 14 on the season. It's now 21-3. Well, they'll officially calibrate it at 33 yards on the field goal, so the Rockets finally do come up with something. Would they try an onside kick here? Do they have anything to lose? They've only averaged one point per penetration inside the 20. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Leonard Smith gathers it in at the 13. Across the 20, out past the 30 to about the 31-yard line. Smith, the ball carrier. By Frank Egris was the kicker made the stop. Ten plays, 37 yards, took 318, but uh, could have easily maybe been a touchdown somewhere along the way, don't you think? <laughs> well, they need to. That's 0 for 3 inside the 20, and we have a man down on the field, but 0 for 3 inside the 20 as far as scoring touchdowns. That was a problem, not just field goals, but scoring the big one, the touchdown. That's what you got to do when you get down there. Well, you made a key observation earlier in the week as you started to look at the Toledo stats. Anytime your field goal kicker has more field goals than you have touchdowns, uh, that's going to lead you lead to believe that they're having trouble getting it in the end zone. And the spread is getting wider here. Have to find out exactly who that is down on the field. Maybe uh, number 32 for Toledo, Rick Hara. See if we can see him right there. You see the left-hand side. Uh, tough to see what happened to him, though. Looked like he just tripped over his own man. Mm -hmm. okay, he's in little pain. On the left right side there. of the screen. Maybe, there we are. Maybe it's his own man whipped around. There it is. You see it with the whip? That happens so often. He's got a knee, a knee problem. Looks like a hyperextended type deal. It wasn't from the side, but it was straight on. So many times uh, you end up on that whip when one guy comes whipping around and just smacks you as he, as he, he actually leg whips his own man, which is what happened there. He caught that full forward, so it's probably not any of the side ligaments, but the cruciate ligament, which holds it going frontwards and backwards. Well, with the velocity that those guys hit each other with, it's a wonder they don't get injured more often. And, of course, coming up, this Sunday, NFL game day, 11.30 a.m. Eastern time, Chris Berman. NFL primetime, 7 p.m. Eastern live. And, of course, the Patriots and the Giants. They'll kick it at 8 o'clock this coming Sunday night. And you see Hera being helped off the field. And, uh, boy, that was a vicious leg whip down there. Yeah, it sure is. And the one bad part about playing football is you learn all the uh, different ligaments in your knee. Most people don't know which ones are which, but football players know cruciates and uh, uh, anterior ligaments and so forth. Hurons will start first down at 10 now. And the 21-3 lead, 11-36 left in the third quarter of play. Oh my, Patton with a huge gaping hole, and he takes advantage, rambles out to the 49. Well, when you get holes like this, uh, I know Patton likes them, but really anybody could run through them. I, not to take anything away from Patton, but watch this hole. I mean, watch the block by the fullback. I mean, you talk about being able to drive a truck through, and then he makes a man miss in the secondary, but you cannot give Patton or anybody that type of hole. Looks like he got a helmet in the back, too. A little bit shaken up after that play, so Bob Foster checks in. 
Well, no sense in running it. Look up field and throw it. Wide open at about the 30-yard line. Bauscher on the tackle, but Ostrander comes up with another big catch over the middle. Well, again, the run play set that up. This time, the linebackers are up there and say, geez, that big hole, we got to stand up and stop that hole, plug that hole. So what do they do? He just waits down there. There's a big gap between the linebackers. He just waits for the ball to get there. Pretty easy. It looked like pitch and catch. One might think with a, an 18-point lead, you start to try and run that clock a little bit, try and run the tailback, but that's not the case. Here I'm still playing aggressive football. This time caught in the backfield is Foster, but he manages to get back to the line of scrimmage and maybe even picks up a yard. Well, Toledo went with a uh, safety blitz on that one, trying to fill all the gaps. If you can't do it with your normal defense, you got to take chances. And uh, you send eight men, you put one in each gap, and hopefully that'll stop the running play. It sure did that time. Keith Dunbar, transfer from the University of Tennessee, and on the tackle that time. The problem is when you split a couple of those guys, there's nobody left after the blitz. Benziger split out wide to the right. Reverse. There it is. Crack back block. Gets wide open. Benziger turns the corner. He's at the 25 to the 20 in traffic now. Down to about the 16-yard line. Not a surprise. That's the sixth time this year that Benzinger has run the flanker reverse. Now he's only got six yards going in, in this game on five carries because he had some good 13 yards and some that lost. But this one, again, when you set it up with the pass and with the run, it opens it up on the reverse, too. A little crack back block there, and Benzinger just has plenty of room to run. This kid's a sprinter on the track team, so you give him some room to run with the football, he's liable to go all the way. Ball spotted on the 16. Only a freshman. he got three more years at Eastern Michigan. <laughs> Changing the cadence just a little bit. A flag on the play. Patton's got some running room inside the 10 and shoved out of bounds by Bauscher at the 6 and another flag. So a pair that time as Gary Patton scrapes himself up off the turf. And I think they're going to call a clip on Craig Ostrander, the wide receiver, when he came back. It looked like it was a pretty good block to me, but uh, that's where the flag went down when he cut to the outside. It was offsides on Toledo, the original call. But I think the second call was a clip, so they will have to sort this whole mess out. And now they'll tell us. Offsides, defense, clipping, offense, offsetting penalties, replay the down. And here's the clip as you go around there and watch Ostrander right here. That's pretty close to being right in the side. He hit the helmet right on the side of the shoulder pads. I don't think I'd uh, call that as a clip. I thought that was a pretty good block. Awfully close. And they say get your head in front, but as long as it's not in the back, then it's not a clip. And it looked like uh, he had his head right on the side. I sure laid him out, though. <laughs> yeah, it's no fun if you're a defensive back. Huron's looking for more. They lead 21 to 3 here in the third quarter. Blitz. Blitz is on. Pitch to Patton, and he's rambled out of bounds at the 14. Sideline got on the short side. They ran that counter option into the sideline and just ran out of room. Michael McCreary was glad that sideline was there because he wasn't going to catch him if he had another yard or two. Gary Patton coming into this one averaging just a fraction less than five yards a carry. For his career, he's averaging almost five yards a carry. That's phenomenal. On top of that, 12 touchdowns. You got six by Foster, so you know, you talk about 18 touchdowns coming into this game by your tailbacks. That's a lot of production out of one position. Right, and then Nash and Jimmy Johnson have added a few of their own at the fullback spot. Split backs, don't see it very often. Adams looking for seven more. And it's a battle in the corner of the end zone. Neither player able to come up with a football. Well, the ball just hung up there a long way. That was a long throw. You can see he's all the way to the left hash to the right corner of the end zone. Jones on the defensive back made a good play and catching up. But you see it's a wobbly pass and look how long. I think you might have to fair catch that baby and almost went out of bounds too. That was not a good throw. Third down and eight now and uh, when you're trying to pass the ball you run out of room when you get inside the 15. A little easier to defend too isn't it Stan? Well sure it is. You, don't, you have the great equalizer behind you. You know they can't go deep at the end line so you play tight you play in front of them. Tailback pass 
inside the 15, back to about the line of scrimmage. Steve Huffman in on the tackle. Exactly, and watch Huffman fill the hole. This is what you have to do as a linebacker. You gotta fill the hole right there, take on that fullback. He stuffed the hole, the fullback right there, and allowed both he and his fellow players to close off the gap. You know, if you take him on too deep or back too far, it creates a separation. You need to take that guy, the fullback on, right in line with the other defensive players to close off all the gaps. Tim heading it on to try the field goal. It'll be a 32-yard attempt with the breeze. Splits the upright. So Hennigan, who has been very solid this year, he's now eight out of nine on the season in the field goal department, makes it a 21-point lead for the Hurons. Hill. Precision. Strength. And stamina. To bring you the best. ESPN has assembled an outstanding schedule of NFL games. Every Sunday night, your cable connection to the NFL is ESPN. That has been a familiar sight here this evening at the Glass Bowl, the Eastern Michigan kickoff team. 24-3. And at this point in time, if you're a Huron fan, you realize... If they win here this evening, they will share at least a piece of that MAC football championship for the first time in the school's history. Nice long kick. Smiley drops it and picks it back up. Manufactures a few more yards and gets doubled out of bounds at the 26. He dribbled that one, took one hop, pushed it to the ground, picked it back up, and went. Yeah, if they uh, win tonight, then Kent State can beat uh, Bowling Green on Saturday. I think that would send them to the uh, California Bowl. Yep. Of course, a buddy of mine coaches up at Kent State, a classmate of mine at uh, Ohio State. And I'm thinking about telling Glenn Mason to go back to Ohio State. They could use him back as the offensive coordinator there. They need to put some points on the board. You know, Glenn Mason started the season with no gray hair, but the way they've won a couple of ball games, he's been reaching for that reach and formula as of late. Oh, my. Head-on collision at the 28. Smiley and Jerry Smith just flat introduced themselves. Smith with 35 tackles thus far in the season from the secondary position with three interceptions and a couple of fumble recoveries. Uh, they get the most out of their secondary people. Well, I tell you what, that's what's called filling the gap on that one. There was a hole there, and he filled that sucker. Hutchinson this time splits out wide to the right. Hughley. Flanker to the left. Bergen gets rid of it. Evans turns, squares, tries to come up field, and finally gets wrapped up at about the 37. Good sight by Bergen. He saw Jerry Smith coming on the blitz from the outside, and he knew nobody was going to pick him up. Did he see him or did he hear him? Well, I, <laughs> I think he said, let's see if he looks back. I think he feels him because he starts going to his right, just filtering to his right a little bit, and hits Evans over the middle. Good throw and smart enough to get rid of it before he had to take the lick. Terry Evans, a heck of a baseball player. We'll play baseball this spring, uh, this spring for Toledo. Bergen runs out of trouble. Diving stab by Hughley, but he can't come up with a play. We've got a flag in the Toledo backfield. Yeah, I think we had a holding in the backfield anyhow. I don't think it would have counted. Fullback was holding the outside uh, linebacker coming in. He was beat, so he just grabbed a hold of him, almost pulled him down. And those backs always do that to us linebackers, you know, every time. It just would tackle us. Yeah, that's because the main responsibility of a running back is to ensure the health and safety of your quarterback. The only way you can do that. Holding, offense, first down. Is to hold at the last possible moment. Well, puts him in a bad situation, second and 20, so... Tell you what, they got to start putting the ball in the air more and more as the clock goes down. Seven and a half minutes left in the third quarter. Still three scores down. Well, the Road Warriors from Eastern Michigan have pretty much done the job thus far. They're three and one in the MAC on the road, trying to go four and one, and that would be astonishing when you consider the fact that they beat Kent State and Miami on the road. Little dump off screen. 
Perry gets whacked. He fumbles the football, and Menard covers it up at the 32-yard line. And once again, the Hurons have come up with a big play defensively. Not only that, we saw a graphic before the game about the problems Eastern Michigan has on artificial turf. Well, they seem to be playing pretty well on this uh, fake grass tonight. Well, that's an interesting note because all week long, the Hurons practiced at the University of Michigan, where they obviously had the AstroTurf. And as difficult as it was for you to enter that stadium yesterday to watch them practice, I was proud of you, Stan. Yeah, it sure brought back a lot of bad memories going into that 105,000-seat uh, stadium. Unfortunately, you were 0-2 as a part of the Buckeye contingent in Ann Arbor. Very quickly, going to try and strike for some more. Ostrander's back deep. Oh, the ball hit him right square in the helmet. Turned underneath it, and he got hit in the back of the head. <laughs> You'll hear about that in the, in the films, because when you win, it's really a lot of fun. And they'll take it off to him. This hits him right square in the back of the helmet. Ball's thrown over the other shoulder. He makes the move. Now watch it. Hits right in his face mask, and then comes back. Almost a great catch. <laughs> the point went right down. The point may have got him in the nose. <laughs> You imagine if that is stuck in the face mask? Huh? Touchdown. Interesting. <laughs> well, he had a bird's eye view. He watched it all the way in, as the coaches tell you. Come on. No doubt about that. Just couldn't come up with a play. Oh, a dangerous pitch, and the ball comes right back to Patton, almost as if it was like a yo-yo. <laughs> well, they came with the all-out blitz, and Ron Adams knew he was going to get smashed, and he said, I'm just going to try to lead Patton with the ball. Well, he let him a little bit too much, but on the AstroTurf, you get a lot of true bounces. It just came up right to Patton. Watch, see the blitz coming? Nobody on him. He said, let me get rid of this football. He throws it out in front of Patton. He really wasn't looking. He, he just assumed where Patton would be. And luckily, again, he came up with the uh, ball and got back to the line of scrimmage. That's a, a great play just to get back to where you were. Jim Harkema pondering the future of his Hurons. Benzinger's in there. Look out. Cup. First time he's caught the football here this evening. They've been hiding him all night long, and he finally gets shoved out of bounds at about the 17. Ninth reception on the year for big number 84. He's been quiet all night. Yeah, I expected them to throw the football quite a bit more to Cup, the tight end on play action. I thought we'd see a lot of those. Well, he's a converted defensive tackle, and Jim Harkimus says he may be our best by the time he's done playing here. It's 24-3. Huron's on top by three touchdowns in the third quarter. Patton running out of trouble. Cuts it inside the 10 down to about the six-yard line where John Bauscher finally wraps him up. Again, just not keeping contained. Uh, he made that all his own. They had played well in the middle. It only takes one guy to break down on defense to ruin everything you're doing. All those guys busting themselves up front, taking on people, and the man does not keep his containment, and uh, Patton just makes a great break around the end and goes down for a first down at the six-yard line. Patton second among the MAC records as far as all-purpose yardage is concerned, and I don't think he's going to quite catch up with Miami's George Schwarm, but uh, nevertheless, a tremendous career. There you see the wishbone. Jimmy Johnson tries the left side. Mark Ward holds on for dear life. The rest of the Rockets catch up. And the pursuit finally hauls Jimmy Johnson down at the two. <laughs> That's pretty good running by Jimmy Johnson. They told us uh, he was a tailback playing fullback. It really wasn't the fullback tight. But he sure runs like a fullback this time. They ran with Patton Block. And you can see Patton wasn't much of a blocker on that. But uh, I tell you what, Jimmy Johnson wanted to get into that end zone. He almost carried three people in there. But that's why you don't assume they're going, you don't think they're going to go to Patton sign because he just did a little duck into the turf and didn't touch anybody. Marquard tried to tie and rope him, finally dragged him down at the two. Full back, and did Nash get home? I don't think so. Nope, he went over the top and didn't get much. There wasn't a whole lot to get on that one. Brian Gable and Tony Herself, defensive interior front. Jim Harkema wants, uh, <laughs> he's telling them something. You see what they do on this is that one man signals in the formation and then he sends in the play. But with this wishbone, now they are going to send in the back with the play. The 
number one scoring team in the MAC, the Eastern Michigan Hurons, averaging better than 26 points a game. Adams will take it himself and stretch out and sneak it in. So Ron Adams with his second touchdown on the evening and his fifth on the season. That's tough on a linebacker. You got both Patton and Foster in there. You're looking key and fit, trying to figure out which one of them is going to get the ball. And he just takes that quick snap, Adams, and jumps into the end zone before you can even react. He's there. He gets that yard. He's over the top. And you're still waiting for Patton and Foster to get the football. Ron Adams, 6 feet, 205 pounds, and he's strong enough to take it in. Boy, what a game he has had here this evening. The fifth-year senior out of Taylor, Michigan. Hennigan for the extra point. It's up and good. So it's now 31 to 3. The Hurons in a position really taking control of this one at the glass bowl as Adams takes it over for his second touchdown of the evening. And there you see Jim Harkema. He's excited. Action on the ESPN. The defending Super Bowl champion New York Giants take on the New England Patriots at 8 Eastern right after NFL primetime on the ESPN. Well, it's a little too early to start celebrating, but at the same time, when you lead by 28 with just 4.15 left in the third quarter, uh, your spirits have to be brightened if you're rooting for Eastern Michigan. Well, you look across and you see a lot of Eastern Michigan fans just reveling in this near uh, share of the championship. And we talked about before the game how far they've come. Did they believe they could actually not just win but be champions? Well. It looked like they believe it to me. They're on the road to that championship goal. Oh, ricochets and jumps out of bounds inside the 15-yard line. You mentioned it in the pregame at one time during between the years 1980 and 1982, Eastern Michigan lost 27 consecutive football games. And that was about as low as they could ever go. Jim Harkema took over at the end of the 82 season. Again, the winners. Please pick up your and uh, has turned things around completely. Well, they lost 10 games his first year he was there. Right. The next year, the league asked them to please don't play football in the MAC anymore. He persevered, they persevered, and now they're getting a reward for their perseverance and in, uh, in in at least a share of that championship. And I guess, yeah, look at that. They're, they're not going anywhere. They're going to stay here. They'll be here all night if they, if they have to, to uh, really enjoy this MAC championship, something that they probably couldn't have even fathomed three years ago. I guess Columbia Rooters can take heart. Maybe in three years, they can be winning the Ivy League. Well, it's always darkest before the dawn, right? <laughs> <laughs> what is it in a row, 36? Uh, I don't know. Well, I know it's, bad it's up there somewhere. <laughs> and a little turnaround. It certainly has for the Eastern Michigan Hurons. Angle once again. This time Smiley runs it down at the 15. Really nothing doing there. Tries to break through a couple of tackles and does so and finally ends up at the 26-yard line. Well, to set the story straight, Kent State would play Bowling Green this Saturday if Kent State wins. And then obviously it's championship time. And there you see the scoring drive. And the man who took it over from the one, a very tough customer for Jim Harkema, his quarterback, Ron Adams. Yeah, and you have to contain him. We talked about make him throw the ball. You know, contain him, contain his scrambling. You know, he's going to beat you more with his legs this year than he is with his arm. Now, he threw that one Hail Mary pass, and he's throwing the ball pretty well, but where's he hurt you the most? Running the football. Bergen on the roll. Oh, what a great effort that time, but can't come up with a play. Pat Johnson. Pat Had it and then lost it. Hit him in the worst possible spot, right, Stan? Well, they love to throw that fullback either on a delay pattern, which was the fumble play right before the last touchdown drive of Eastern Michigan to John Perry. And this time with Pat Johnson in there, it hits him right in between the numbers. And that's why they're, I guess, they're fullbacks instead of tailbacks. <laughs> Bergen sets up, gets wrapped up after a four-man rush, and he's dropped in the backfield by Eric Miller once again. That's Miller's second sack on the evening. And that's 
Turning out to be a very long night for number five, Bill Bergen. Well, this is a fun time for defense because you know, you know, you, you can build up your stats now. You go for sacks, you go for interceptions. Eric Miller here, his second sack of the night. He's now got five and a half on the season. He led the team last year with six and a half sacks. So he wants to get back to where he was last year, maybe even improve on it. And he's got that opportunity with a couple tonight. Bergen once again. Gonna scramble and air it out. It's a jump ball, and it's picked off in the secondary. Brian Carter with a football, and he is finally collared at the 39. So it's just one turnover after another in Eastern Michigan. Hooting and hollering. Their fans are enjoying this one. Yeah, you might as well throw it, though. He had nothing yep. to lose at that point. Heck no. Toss it up there. Maybe something good will happen like it did for Eastern Michigan. They also have a face mask penalty. It's going to be tagged on to the end of that interception return by Brian Carter. But again, I don't think uh, Uli really helped uh, Bergen that much when the ball was in the air. It's a couple times he's been a little bit timid about going after the football. Face mask. Defense. Well, and things aren't getting any better for the Rockets, but Eastern Michigan fans are having a great time. with 3.10 left in the third quarter of play. And it's not been a fun evening for Toledo Rocket fans, but uh, they've won a couple of MAC football championships in the last seven years in 81 and in 84, so they know what it's like to end up on top of the stack. Foster down to the 15. Where he likes to run the football, he likes to get that ball inside and make that cut. We've seen some films where he just busted right up the gut and walked into the end zone. Sometimes even carried people in the end zone. Tough runner. You know, it's a nice luxury for Jim Harkham to be able to play a sophomore tailback as much as he has Foster this year to prep him for next year. Well, that's because he knows you don't lose a whole lot. Six for 60, 10 yards a pop. That's pretty good. Johnson will try it from the fullback position off left tackle. Tom Gruno. Well, this is a terrible time for uh, defensive players for Toledo right now. You're beat down. You know they can do whatever they want to on you. If they want to throw, they can throw. If they want to run, they feel they can just knock you off the football. You're just out there. This is survival time right now. You know, you like you're in a foxhole out there. You need somebody beside you. Well, the most wins in over a decade for an Eastern Michigan team was eight and three back in 1977. Should they win tonight, they'll be eight and two heading into the season finale. Foster got hit in the backfield, but still managed to get to the 10. Dwayne Smith, only a freshman out of Genesee, Michigan. They're very high on that youngster. And on the tackle. Yep. Toledo's going to play a lot of people right now. I'm sure that uh, Dan Simrel's looking to see what type of talent he's got. I mean, at this point, realistically, you got to start looking for next year, looking for spring practice, see what type of people you can do, give them some game experience, see if they can play. Rockets losing a pair of games this season by less than five points. Foster again, this time grabbed in the backfield by Brian Gable, six foot four inch, 236 pound senior out of Richfield, Ohio. Foster the ball carrier, stopped by Brian Gable. Yeah, it's gotta be tough on the seniors at this point. Coming in here, it was Parents' Day, you know, our last game here. It's tough to go out this way. You know, they've had a, a lot of them been here for five years, and to go out, you know, in a national television game like this when you had high hopes and well uh, being down 31 to three at the end of the third quarter is tough. Adams feels the pressure, loops it out to Johnson. Johnson gets a block and then gets nailed at about the six. Pretty good play over there. Keith Saunders coming up from the strong safety spot to make the hit. Strong safety is a good way to describe Keith Saunders. Strong safety, 6'1", 185, is the strongest player on the team. 415-pound bench press. And he needed all of that with Jimmy Johnson with a head of steam build up going down that left sideline. Saunders is a converted linebacker. It's fourth down now and two. And... Are we going to see it? You betcha. 
Johnson the up back. Oh, this has been an effective formation this evening. There's the pitch on the cross. Foster gets a block. And going to be awfully close to the first down. They had been... They had been... Uh, 71% of the time, they had made first downs on fourth down. And it's a first down. Raise that percentage. And we've finished up three quarters of play. It's 31-3. Lee all along that he could coach this team to an MAC championship. It was just a question of convincing, convincing his kids, and he has his fifth-year seniors as they lead 31-3. And they're looking for more here at the start of the fourth quarter. Johnson over the top, fumbled the football, and Toledo recovers her note at Eastern Michigan. Oh, no, is it Brian Klaus? It is. Klaus, the left guard, ended up with a football, and that'll probably be the first and only touchdown of his career. I guess so. He started 41 straight games. Brian Klaus has been a great player for him. He came here as a 6'1", 210-pound player, and he's risen himself. He's grown a little bit to 6'3", and he's put on... 50 pounds to go 265 and be a great right guard and uh, that has to be a highlight for him on national television scoring a touchdown. Brian Klaus, 6'3", 265 pounds and now he's got a touchdown as Hennigan finishes it off and you know 25, 30 years from now Klaus will probably tell his grandchildren, oh yeah I dashed it in from the one. That's right, great run. Broke four or five tackles. We have a flag down on the extra point off sides. I'm sure they will decline that and uh, use it on the kickoff. But yeah, he'll, he'll tell all the stories about uh, his great moves. Defense on the kickoff. Quite good. Now that, that one yard plunge will probably turn into about a 15 yard end around or something like that. <laughs> That's right. Well, Jimmy Johnson just tries to go over the top. He wants to score. See, so he just dives over top and is hit in midair. Just a hand knocked the ball out. Falls into the end zone. And right there, who's going to get it? Offensive lineman's dream, Brian Klaus. That's just the story of the way the game has gone, the way Toledo's season has gone. Well, you can better believe that Klaus probably put a vice grip on that football when he saw it shake loose. Sure did. And Jimmy Johnson, really, if you look at it from that angle, he lost the football without anybody even hitting him. The ball just, he tried to one-hand it when he leaped, and it just came out of his hand and maybe he knew Klaus was over there just going to help his uh, blocking buddy up front. I would, right. I would imagine that's the last we'll see of Ron Adams and Gary Patton and Foster and a bunch of guys now for Eastern Michigan. Well, the better than 1,000 Road Warrior fans that made the 45-mile trek from Ypsilanti I think will probably stay until the final gun and maybe even a few minutes afterward to savor this one. They'll be here and uh, they are enjoying it to say the least. You know, they were put to that challenge back in 84 when they said, hey, your attendance isn't good enough to stay in this league. Uh, we aren't going to allow you to play. They persevered. They got, uh, you know, back into the MAC. And now they're averaging uh, 14, 15,000 people a game over in Eastern Michigan. And that has nowhere to go but up as uh, Jim Harkerman has really turned that program around over there in a short time. Interesting note as well. They received more votes in the last AP pool than the team that's very close to them, the University of Michigan. Yeah, they get to use their field now because they uh, are ranked ahead of them in the uh, AP ratings. Well, this one was a single to right center field that nobody ended up catching as it ricocheted out of bounds. And let's take a look at the road Warriors road record. Boy, that win at Miami is a big one, scoring 35 against the Redskins. Yeah, and that Kent, uh, Kent State. Kent State had a last-second field goal hit the right upright and bounce backwards. <laughs> but that's just the way. When things go right for you, they go right all year, and the little things get turned around, just like we saw that pass at the end of the first half. It bounces up, and they catch it. Uh, when you're hot, you're hot. And right now, Jim Harkema in Eastern Michigan is a hot football squad. I think Ron Adams is trying to uh, express his interest. Well, <laughs> right now they are number one, aren't they? Atop the stack in the MAC race. Boy, all the coaches will tell you that forget about what happens in the first five or six weeks of the MAC conference. The last couple of weeks normally determines who will end up heading to the California Bowl. Rick Isaiah 
runs it down, drops it, and then picks it up. He's going to have to hurry. Snowed under at the five-yard line, and sometimes it just doesn't go right. <laughs> yeah, you can't. Nothing else can go wrong for these guys. Well, I guess it could. They could uh, hand the ball off to the wrong team here going into the end zone. But uh, Toledo's uh, year is just epitomized by what's happened tonight. Just everything has gone wrong. Luckily, unless hope this remains that way, nobody's got hurt. The amazing thing is, ten MAC teams have come in here, the last ten, and gone away losers. As we've got a change of quarterback for the Toledo. Rockets. Number 15, Mark Melfi takes over. There you see him on the year. Two touchdowns, two interceptions, and uh, really was playing quite well until he tore some ligaments in his right index finger against Northern Illinois. That can affect the quarterback. Yep. Your right hand when you're right-handed. Uh, I've had uh, some ligament uh, damage. I don't know how he can throw the ball at all. Still coming off that injury. It's kind of a mesh between a runner and a thrower. Nice hole opens up that time for Neil Trotter, who crosses the 20. Of course, the season's not over for Toledo. Obviously, they play on the road against Central Michigan, and then they have a big one down south. Yeah, they had to go down to the Orange Bowl and play the Miami Hurricanes. And uh, <laughs> I guess that's a nice way to end the season on a trip to Miami. But uh, I tell you what. Uh, they're going to, as uh, Dan Simmerl said, they may throw the ball 80 times that game. And he was talking about his team. They're going to go down there and have some fun if they can. On the delay, caught in the backfield is Trotter. Nice tackle that time by John Stoitsiaitis. Ah, you had to say that. You were hoping he wouldn't. <laughs> you got it right, too. All right. Well, thank you very much. All right. I knew you could do it. <laughs> John Stoitsiaitis. Watch him come from the outside. They're on a blitz. I guess Easter's not going to let up. They're going to send their people. He just makes a tackle in the backfield. When you blitz against a counter play, I mean, you got it. I tell you what, that's exactly what you want to do because it's so slow developing that you are in there with penetration and the timing is completely thrown off. Second down and a bundle. 16. Nope. Not much doing there. Now when you slip and fall, third down and long. No? <laughs> yeah, just uh, again, everything that's happened uh, right now to Dan Simmerl, he's just saying figures, figures. That's, uh, that's the way things are going. And he's done such a great job at Toledo. And, uh, you know, they were picked to win the championship this year. But when you lose people like that at key positions, uh, you know, I don't think there's anybody, any coach in the world that can overcome that. It's funny because I think in 1984 they were picked eighth and they won the league. Salvage a first down. Melfi in trouble. Let's it go, and the pass is broken up by Stoitsiaitis. Two plays you have to talk about. Hey, he's a heck of a player. Two good plays. I tell you what, he's script. I mean, we saw it in our pregame segment. Last script, a man uh, on the 10-yard line for Ohio U took the ball right out of his hands and ran 83 yards the other direction. Really changed the whole complexion of that football game because Ohio U was given Eastern Michigan all they wanted to up at that point. <laughs> Grimm will have to kick from his end zone. No block. Ooh. Boy, that was a near block. Good Toledo bounce, but the ball ends up at the 35. So the Road Warriors from Eastern Michigan will have great field position again, but then they've pretty much had that all night long. They lead by a bunch here at the Glass Bowl, 38-3. Presentation of college football is being brought to you by AT&T, the right choice. And for the first time this evening, Tom Sullivan will quarterback the Eastern Michigan Hurons, so Ron Adams is done for the night. Second pass of the year, first completion. Greg Williams comes up with a catch. Or was that Ostrand? Nope, Ziegler. <laughs> 0 for 3. That's right. Sullivan 0 for 1 going into this game. He came in last week against Ohio U in a mop-up role, just handing off. 
and uh, Jim Hockerman said he didn't want him to throw because he felt for the coach at OU didn't want to pile it up but he really feels he needs to get this guy some game action throwing the football well, he hasn't seen much playing time Johnson now in the tailback position crosses the 15 down to about the 14. You see Sullivan getting a chance to play a little bit. Did uh, you play much as uh, what a sophomore? Did you start playing as a sophomore at Ohio State? I was a place kicker as a sophomore and a backup linebacker. No kidding. Yeah, I set records at Ohio State. Uh, two in one year, the most extra points made and the most missed. <laughs> How many did you make? I made 39, missed 13 extra points. So you know I went to a linebacker full time the next year. Oh, jeez, 13. Well. They scored enough touchdowns, that's for sure. And so is Eastern Michigan here this evening. Jimmy Johnson pulled down from behind. So, in other words, you kicked as a sophomore and then gave it up as a junior. There was a lot of wind in Ohio State. You see, Sullivan is uh, you know, new into the game, and the snap is always the key. Sometimes it's tough. You haven't worked with the center. Watch him right here. Has a tough time. He just holds on to it with his fingertips. Makes a good play out of it. That ball could have dropped down, but he stayed with it, got the fingertips, and pulled it up and handed it off. Boy, in a cool night when we're standing over there on the sidelines. Haven't had a chance to really get a feel for the football, although he's probably been clapping all night long. Sullivan takes a good look at the secondary. Now he's going to pump and run for his life, and he's finally wrapped up and thrown out of bounds. Out of bounds. You know, Jim Harkin, when we asked him yesterday, he said, listen, what happens if Ron Adams happens to get hurt or dinged and can't play? Do you have anybody? I mean, the other guys only throw one pass. He said, listen, Tom Sullivan is a good quarterback. We can win with Tom Sullivan. Now, of course, he wants to get him some experience here. Let him run the team a little bit. But he has a lot of confidence. He was surprised me as much confidence as he showed in Tom Sullivan for as little as the guy has played. I'll try a field goal now, huh? Hennigan checks in, and it'll be... Wait a minute, it's John Lopp. That's right. Lopp will attempt for the first time this evening. And that one's not even close. Way wide to the right. No more points for Eastern Michigan, but they got plenty at this point. Someone is still having fun on the sideline, if you can believe that, uh, dressed up as a Toledo Rocket. Is that the Rocket man? Uh, I guess it might be. Well, he's not giving up. That's the important thing. Mel Fi with room to run. Pops the throw. And he completes the pass. Out to about the 32-yard line. Joe Windover. Joe Windover. Fourth reception on the season for the sophomore from Midland, Michigan. Well, it's been a tough year. Steve Keene started a quarterback. He got injured in the Toledo or the uh, Temple game. And Mel Fi played some. Bergen got hurt. Melfi came in last week against Kent State, took him right down the field to the 10-yard line, and within reach of uh, the winning touchdown, just couldn't quite get it in. Smiley chased across the wide side of the field, didn't end up with much positive yardage for that run. Eastern Michigan, uh, that defense really teeing off at this point. I tell you, this is fun time for the defense. You just let them rip. Nothing to worry about. You go for your stats. You know, sacks, interception, take gambles here. That's, this is fun time for defense. This is the part I never wanted to come out of the game now. They said these sending the other guys, no, no, I might get an interception or something. Tip ball, who knows? Don't take me out now. Oh. I can't believe you're saying you defensive guys or something else. Yeah, just greedy guys, you know? <laughs> Take anything you can get, right? Trotter escapes two, three, four hits, and he still keeps driving forward. That was about as impressive a run as we've seen all night. And uh, there's a Western, I mean, Eastern Michigan player down on the field right now, Mike Scuba. Mike Trotter turned into a battering ram on this play. Watch all the missed tackles. Just a counter play. Luckily, no blitz. Two men blocked one, and he just took on all the rest of the people himself. One, two, three, four, five. The sixth guy, he didn't even get him down. I tell you what, that's a strong run right there. That, uh, that gives you a lot of. Uh, confidence in that man's ability to uh, progress as a runner injured player down on the field we'll find out who that is in just a moment or so 38 to 3 
And obviously those students are well aware of Chris Berman's record picking those NFL games on game day Sunday, Stan. He's way ahead of the game, isn't he? Uh, I don't know. Wh which game? NFL game day. And Chris will be there live and direct at 11.30 a.m. Eastern live, of course. And then NFL primetime starts at 7 o'clock. And uh, all the action, Patriots and the Giants trying to regroup if they possibly can. This all of it on ESPN. You're playing golf with uh, Chris Berman. You better wear a hard hat. That's all I got to say. <laughs> and that step in front of him. Fullback comes up with a pass reception and runs it on to about the 48. And that man right there, he looks very familiar, the head coach of Notre Dame, Digger Phelps, and he's here on hand to watch his son, number 41, Rick Phelps, play for the Toledo Rockets. Unfortunately, uh, Rick Phelps is uh, on the Toledo kickoff team, and they haven't seen a lot of action tonight. Nope, right about that. Nice to see Digger on hand, getting those Irish ready for the upcoming NCAA basketball season. By English. He's not going to leave, is he? No. He was just. Heck no, the parents eat, never right? leave, right? Yeah, all right, okay. <laughs> it was funny. I had a chance to watch his son practice a little bit this week. And uh, I will say this I know why he's not playing basketball. He, he really does enjoy contact. When he goes down the field, he's going to find somebody to run into. Hopefully, it's a ball carrier. I'll tell you what, Digger's basketball players all look like they enjoyed contact when I saw him. Are you kidding me? Yeah, that's a physical style yes, over sir. there. Melfi gets it out, but Windover just can't quite stretch out and hang on. 7.50 left in this one. The flag down over here uh, on the other side of the field, a little altercation, maybe a little holding penalty on the defense. And believe it or not, they were blitzing on that play. Are you kidding me? They aren't going to let up at all, are they? They're going to want to keep them off the scoreboard. Well, you have to think a little bit about that. You know, they got to play them again next year. <laughs> That's right. Better uh, mind your P's and Q's because what goes around comes around. Well, when you consider how far this program has come in just five years' time, and uh, it was really very enjoyable to sit and chat with Jim Harkema yesterday afternoon after they had practice. And he said, you know, it's, it's been such a long road, but we've come a long way. And I think the kids finally realize that now they have a chance to walk through the door and become champions. And boy, they have played like the MAC champs here tonight. You can hear those pads pop across the 24-yard line. Yeah, a lot of guys getting a, a chance to play, and there's a Jim Harkema. I know he realizes right now that they got at least a share of that championship, and I'm sure he's going to tell them. Look at that record. Look how it's going up. 110, 2-7, 4-7, 6-5 over the hump into winning. Now not just winning this year, but winning a championship in 87. It was funny because the year they won two and tied two, he said you'd have thought we won the Super Bowl. <laughs> then they went four and four, and then they relaxed a little bit. They thought they were really good at that point. There you go. They were an upper-level team at that point. Here comes the blitz from the backside. Melfi lets it go, and an interception stepping right in front of the receiver is Jerry Smith. That was too easy. <laughs> he just lofted that ball up there, and Jerry Smith uh, almost was patting his glove, and you can see Dan Simmerl asking, why did you throw that? Interception number four on the season for number 31, and right now he's living it up at the glass bowl. T. Rowe Price have a, a problem with their formation here. It's unbalanced, and I don't think they want it unbalanced. Somebody lined up on the wrong side. Well, nevertheless, you can make a mistake now and then when you lead like they do at this point. There's the aerial view of the glass bowl. Glass just about empty. Only filled now with Eastern Michigan fans. I imagine they'll have some glasses full a little bit later celebrating. Johnson lost the handoff, got it back, and then fumbled it away. And the Toledo Rockets come up with the loose ball. So this is one of those where you look down and you have to figure whether the glass is half empty or half full. Sure. <laughs> if you're an optimist, it's half full, and Brian Gable is optimistic because he gobbled up the fumble. 
Yeah, just missed the handoff here. It looked like the ball popped out right away. There it is. Johnson just couldn't get a handle on it. It looked like it hit him high. If the quarterback hits it high, it hits the hard surface of the pad and bounces off. you got to get it down in there below the shoulder pads in that soft area where the stomach is. The bread basket. Yeah. Well, it's a last-ditch effort now for any kind of a touchdown drive for the Toledo Rockets. Had a couple of golden opportunities early and just couldn't make them pay off. We reverse. No way to go. <laughs> oh, my. Isaiah really got popped by Don <laughs> Shell England. I tell you, yeah, Isaiah was really turning on the Jets when he went around the corner. Watch Rich Isaiah right here. I tell you, he's coming, and all of a sudden, he sees a little greeting party. He goes, uh-oh, <laughs> let me get down here. Somebody tackle me quick. Where's the hole? Where's That's the right. hole? There's not supposed to be anybody. Why didn't you pursue? Mm -hmm. Defense was in hot pursuit. Melfi slips, gathers himself, drills it over the middle, and Isaiah wraps it up. He makes up, comes up with a big catch down to the 30-yard line. They are very high on him. He's got terrific speed, 4-5 speed. Just a freshman. While we've got a moment, we'd like to thank our sponsors and also our spotters here this evening. Kelvin Farmer, who was a terrific running back for Toledo last year, been pointing out uh, the Toledo Rockets to me this evening. And John Hemmel has been working the Eastern Michigan University side. So, guys, thanks for your help this evening. Kelvin probably wishing he was back down there on the field in the tailback position. They could use him. Now Trotter tiptoes the sidelines, finally knocked out of bounds. Kelvin Farmer ended up the number two rusher in the country last year, Stan White. That looked like him right there, didn't it? Uh, good run by Trotter. He watched the cut here. Nice cut by the young running back. Cuts in and cuts back outside down the sideline, keeps his feet inbounds. That's the hardest thing in the world to do. Momentum is carrying you out of bounds, but your feet have to try and stay in. Got to be aware of it. Better late than never. Trotter this time hurtling a block. Throws his body down to about the five. So you have to think of what the emotions that are going through Jim Harkerman right now, all that they've been through. You know, just saving the program there, not just bringing it back up, but just even having a football program in 1984 was his first concern. They got that back. Now they're going to win a championship. He did such a great job at, the, at Grand Valley State. He had a couple guys go to the Lions when I was there. As Trotter finally goes in, they get a touchdown, they finally score, they go inside the 20. But uh, he's been a success everywhere he's been, and he's just capping it off right now at Eastern Michigan. Neil Trotter's first touchdown as a Toledo Rocket. Only a sophomore out of Cincinnati. Jim Harkover exhorting the troops right now, but uh, they give up their first touchdown of the night, but really at this point doesn't make much difference. Well, it makes a difference to... Uh, Neil Trotter, that's for sure. And also to his head coach, Dan Simrel. His first touchdown. I'm sure he'll always remember that. Did you ever score one? Yeah, I got a couple in my day. Did yeah, you? yeah, I got about three. Uh -huh. took, <laughs> took forever to get there, but I finally got there. <laughs> well, they'll go for two. Melfi, watch out for the backside. Gets the pass off. It's caught. And Trotter got stood up and stopped at the one-foot line. So the two-point conversion goes for naught. But the Rocket fans finally get a chance to cheer a little bit here in the glass bowl as Neil Trotter scores for the Toledo Rockets. Make it 38 to 9. Amazing, 38 to 9. Everybody built this one as a very close football game indeed, but the Road Warriors of Eastern Michigan have taken control of this one and notched victory number four on the road in the MAC Conference. Gary Patton picks it off at the 20. And when was the last time you watched him run straight out of bounds? Gary Patton runs it out of bounds. That was just, uh, <laughs> that was just get the ball and don't get hit. There's Rick Phelps, Digger's son. Let's uh, ISO on him. I think a little extracurricular activity. Gets a little late start, but he's humping down the field. I think he gets the... Uh, Gets over close to the bench here and even gets into an official. I think they must know that's Digger's son. He's going to get a piece of him. Watch this. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we know why uh, Patton, now we know why Patton ran out of bounds, right? That's because right. Phelps was heading, he was making a beeline for number 34. 
like I told you, he loves contact. Now it's basically time to just hand off and run out the clock. Meanwhile, though, those Toledo starters have pretty much left the lineup, and you got the reserves in there, and the last thing they want to do is give up any yardage. Get a chance to watch number 33 or 95, those two linebackers for Toledo, two freshmen. Boy, are they something. Steve Bailey, 6'4", 220, and a freshman from right here in Toledo is a heck of a, a, heck of a prospect. Well, Jimmy Johnson's got a chance to carry that ball, that's for sure. Only trouble is about five, six guys in those dark blue jerseys keep catching up with it. Yeah, the offensive linemen now, I guess, are, are not the first line guys out there, and they're just trying to feel their way around. But uh, again, I'm sure it's uh, it's good for him just to get back in that tailback position because I don't know too many tailbacks that uh, that like to play fullback. Although Marcus Allen played fullback for a year out of the U U USC before he became a tailback, so some of them can do it. Most of those tailbacks don't like to block, though. I'm going to tell you, that's a dirty job. I got to run into people like you all the time. <laughs> right up the middle, did that ball shake loose? It might have. The dig, Eastern Michigan got it back. Just enough for a first down. Keep the clock running and... Uh, Move it right on down right now. Uh, Eastern Michigan right now, I think, just wants to uh, start the party, start the celebration. Because now they got, what, 10 days, the nine days? They got a little time to relax and enjoy life a little bit. Mm -hmm. And savor this one because now they've got at least half of the MAC football championship. And hopefully, if it comes down to a game against Bowling Green next week, they would come up and win that one. Uh, that obviously is if you're a Huron fan, if you're rooting for BG, then. You're hoping that they can figure out a way to beat Kent State this week and then also maybe go to Reinerson Stadium and come up a winner. I, I know one thing is for sure. In the Mid-American Conference, as competitive as it is, you have to wait until they sound the final gun of the final game to determine who's going to head out to Fresno, California on December 12th to play in the Cowboy. Looks like, uh, what, San Jose State for sure out there? I think they have to beat Pacific this Saturday if they do the win. Now we got officials throwing the flag here at this point. Don't you hate that as a defensive player? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Come on, give me a break. Get the games over. Let's just uh, run it out. Have a good time here. Try to get some yards. Try to get some tackles. You don't need to call those little holding penalties in the interior line. They don't mean anything now. That's well, air time for some of the officials. There's a, uh, a sad guy right now. He does not like to lose at any time. Especially doesn't like to lose bad, and especially doesn't like to lose bad on television. Mm -hmm. And he bleeds midnight blue when they get beat. I'll guarantee you that. Born, bred, and raised, educated here, played his football here, and has been a coach here ever since the get-go, and uh, has been head coach for the past six seasons and done a marvelous job. But this will be a, a tough pill to swallow here this evening. Well, Toledo had a long winning streak back in the my days. Uh, Frank mm -hmm. Lodiber was the coach here. In fact, I played uh, for Frank. He coached me in pro ball for a couple of years at Baltimore. Yep, from 69 through 71, they won 35 consecutive games. Johnson with a little head move. Finally tackled by the ankles. And coming up right after this football game is completed, an update on Sports Center. And look at that, David Robinson signs. They got to be uh, partying down in San Antonio because the franchise man from the Naval Academy is signed on the dotted line. And what does that mean for the Spurs? Well, it means a lot because they were in danger of losing that first pick in the draft if he doesn't sign, let alone they got to wait a couple of years. But uh, they figure a franchise player like that is worth waiting for. Yeah, he'll end up another two inches taller and probably add another 15 pounds. Well, that's what he did at, uh, at the Naval Academy. I live in Baltimore, real close to the uh, Naval Academy basketball scene there, and he had a great career there. And uh, everybody figures he's going to be a dominant player in the NBA. Well, he's got a big time body, a great shooting touch, very aggressive, blocks a lot of shots. And uh, I don't care any way you, you shake it. Anytime you get that man that can stretch out and plant it up in the paint, you end up on the winning side of the scoreboard more times than not. 
So don't forget all the details coming up on Sports Center. David Robinson signs a big time contract. Jim Harkema and his bunch right now. Oh, they have to be feeling awfully good. Sullivan with a quick pitch. Jimmy Johnson gets whacked at about the 48, but uh, those hits don't seem to, to feel quite the same when you're ahead, do they, Stan? No, they sure don't. Uh, it's funny, you look out here, Toledo had their punt return team in expecting a punt, and, and uh, they had to bring their defense back on now, so that was that's why that hole was so wide. But uh, it's just amazing to uh, see a team dominate like this when just a few years ago they were so bad that everybody across the country was poking fun at them the way that uh, Columbia is looked at right now. You know, this is an offensive a coordinator's favorite formation or head coaches right now who just uh, flop on the ball and the man back there deep in case anything bad would happen. But, you know, that's the last snap we'll have. But Jim Harkema and that whole Eastern Mich Michigan uh, contingent, uh, you know, they really have to be congratulated. This is a great comeback from not only losing 26 in a row, but almost losing their whole program just three years ago. Well, he tried his best to stay loose yesterday. He said today he would do anything possible, take a long walk and just take some deep breaths because he knew it would be a tough one. And there you see Dan Simrell, and he'd be the first to congratulate Jim Harkema on his success because Dan Simrell is, well, he's cherished championships in the Mid-American Football Conference, and right now, that man, Jim Harkema, feeling pretty good about life in the fast lane. Thank you, Dave. Hey, we got another game yet. Jim Harkema all smiles right now because the final score is 38-9. And who would have ever thought that the Hurons would be 4-1? We'll be right back. Well, before the season started, it was supposed to be Toledo on top of the MAC standings. But now, as you look down, all dressed out in white, it's the co-champs at this point, Eastern Michigan at 6-1. And, and it is. And uh, one thing, I guess, the... Uh, they get to celebrate tonight and for a few days, but they got to remember it's not complete yet. They still have one more game, and I'm sure our guest coming up, Jim Harkerman, knows that as well as anybody. That's right, Jim. This is Denny. Uh, I have to ask you the first question right off the top. There's no way in the world you figure you're going to come in here and win 38 to 9. Well, I, I, quite simply, we knew we had to throw the football, and they were lining their linebackers up and coming up real tight, and that opened up those lanes, and after Ronnie got settled down, he really threw the football. I really felt our offense could explode at some point in time, and we finally did tonight. Yeah, the uh, wishbone unbalanced that we talked about yesterday, Jim, it came in there, and it must have worked just as you diagrammed it because Ron Adams almost walked down the field by himself. Well, they were they were unprepared for it, and, and, and the kids really worked hard on it. We've had it in for two weeks, and they really did a heck of a job. And, and Ronnie's coming around on the outside now, and there's a great block. The fullback's all the way down the field, and Ronnie, uh, you know, he won't be denied when that happens. But uh, we got the load block. Gary Patton threw the key block, by the way. That's kind of a nice situation, isn't it, when, you're, when the leading tailback uh, makes the block. Jim, you know, we talked about your fifth-year seniors and what a pivotal role they've played all along in, in your drive towards an MAC championship, and tonight those guys really, really came through. Well, I thought they really played well, and our skill guys played, and, you know, everybody played good. It was a hard football game in the first half. I mean, I, I don't know what anybody else thinks, but it was a hard football game. Once we got the lucky catch down at the end, I shouldn't say lucky for Ziegler, but it was fortunate. Then I thought we had control of the football game. What's your feeling right now going through? You've come so far. You, get, you were at the point one time where you really were questionable whether you're going to have a program. Now you come all the way and you're just within the, you know, within I, one game of winning know, the whole thing. Well, I'm not going to allow myself any of that. Just like I told you last night, we don't have time to think about program. We've got another game to play, and we, we've come too far not to play good next Saturday. And, and, and you know, I, I know that sounds trite, but I, I think we've got to keep our focus. If we don't, We'll end up sad. So you well, let them uh, you let them celebrate for a couple days here, won't you? Well, yeah, they but they're gonna lift weights tomorrow and swim tomorrow, <laughs> and, and uh, then I'll give them a couple days off. But they gotta they gotta keep doing the things they've done to get to this point. So you're tougher than Woody Hayes was. He'd give us at least a day to celebrate. I, I'm not tough at all. I can't <laughs> see that. Coach, congratulations on a marvelous victory, and we'll be back with more as the Eastern Michigan Hurons hoop it up here in the Glass Bowl. Five yards tonight and he wasn't finished watch him heave this baby 49 yards Matt Ziegler never takes his eye off the football touchdown on the bobble and head coach Jim Harker is one away from the crowd 
Well, quarterback from Taylor, Michigan, number 10, Ron Adams. He had to come up with a big game tonight, and uh, he really did, 38-9 to in the final. And there you see Ron on the sidelines. Ron, uh, just a brilliant game on your part. Uh, the last couple of weeks, you've really run the ball maybe better than you've thrown it. Um, it's not something that's been built in, but uh, we, I have had an opportunity to break away from the pressure and get a, get a chance to get the ball downfield, and, you know, it's just something that I'm going to do. Uh, whatever it takes to win the ball game, and that's just something I've been able to do. Ron, this is Stan White. That last play before the first half, uh, was that just a Hail Mary situation? You throw it up and just hope something good happens? Well, we had a we had a couple draw plays that were able to bust loose and get us to midfield, and uh, we had a down and out. I pumped right there, and I just let the ball fly to the corner of the end zone. I didn't get to see the complete play. I just saw the ball tipped up right here. That's what I saw, and then... Uh, the ref was signaling the TD, and I just, I couldn't believe it. It's probably one of the greatest catches that I've had made by me for a receiver. Is that the first time you've ever had one of those prayers answered like that? Um, yes, it is. So that's, that is a great feeling. I've had it happen against me defensively, and it, there's nothing can take the spirit out of you going into halftime like a play like that. Yep. That really broke their backs. But you had a lot of good uh, uh, philosophies, game plan going in. Uh, that uh, wishbone unbalanced sure worked like a charm for you. That, that really did. It caught them off balance. They didn't know uh, what was going on. We had an unbalanced line, and we have an automatic built in where if they react to the unbalance and go to that field, then we run the ball the opposite way. And uh, they were just mixed up, and we caught them at a time that you know, it was beneficial for us. Ron, what's going through your mind? Five years ago, you started in this program. They didn't even want you to play football in the Mid-American Conference. Now you end up with at least a share of the championship. Well, it just uh, shows that all the hard work and dedication and uh, it's all paid off, and we've kept our focus. And it hasn't happened overnight, but uh, it's been a slow process, and the guys have kept pushing, and we never give up. And it just, it's just a credit to the coaching staff, the support that we've gotten from the community and everybody you know it's just it's fabulous we just talked to coach harkema so do us a favor don't celebrate too much because i think he's going to make you lift those weights tomorrow uh that, i don't mind lifting the weights that's what helps me out here on the field it does it keeps me from uh getting banged around by the big fellas so i don't mind that at all well terrific performance tonight and congratulate the rest of that crew in the locker room thank you denny and stan